Hey everyone, how's it going? Um, okay, so we are going to keep going on with what I was doing last week, which was uh, working on re-implementing Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Uh, I don't know if anyone else is familiar with Sonic the Hedgehog 2, um, but it's a great game, and I want to play it again, and I really like it. Um, I haven't played it in a long, long, long time, um, pretty much since I was a kid, but I want to play it again. So I am re-implementing Sonic the Hedgehog 2 in Haskell. Thanks for the host. So, thanks so much for the host, uh, Komet. This is what I've got so far. Um, I did a little bit more work than last week. Last week we had palettes being loaded up, so we knew what colors were being used inside the Hedgehog. Now what we know is, uh, you know, where the pixels go. So we actually have tiles being printed to the screen, and so this is all, this is all implemented in Haskell. It actually loads up um, a disassembled. Um, thank, thank you, Komet. Thanks, thanks for rating. Um, this is actually a disassembled Sonic 2 ROM that it is loading up, um, it is loading up the palettes and it's loading up the tiles and it's loading up all the information. Um, yeah, this is open source. You can check it out. Um, I've got it up on my GitHub somewhere. So check out my GitHub. I'll link this. I'll put it in the Twitch chat in one second. Um, if you go to my repositories, I have Sonic 2. And so you can come here and you can, you can actually build it. And yeah, if you if you build it, you just do a cabal run. Whoops, cabal run, and it will load up the um, the it'll load up all the assets from. I've got a directory in there called um, uh, sorry, it's called S two disassem disassem disassemble. It's a disassembled Sonic two ROM. So basically, someone's taken the Sonic two ROM, split it apart into little bits, and then um, you can load it up separately. So I'm I'm basically only using this so that you know you got art and you got palettes. Just makes it easy, so you don't have to actually index into the ROM. But I probably should just index into a ROM. I should get a ROM and then just index into it. This is probably not very, very legal that they've put up a, a disassembled Sonic 2 ROM, but that's how it is. So I've got I've included that as a sub module. Um, yeah, so you can just uh, load that up if you do a if you clone it and then do a um, sub module update or whatever you have to do to get sub modules included. Then you just do a cabal build, cabal run. Um, I've got a Nix expression there, so you can, if you've got if you got Nix installed, just do a Nix shell and cabal run. And then there you go, you'll have this, um, and it can load up pretty much all the zones. So let me go over to here, and I can modify my Sonic Two main to load up. Um, so at the moment it's doing chemical plant zone. I can load up whatever I want. So Emerald Hill Zone One will probably be the most famous one. So I can load that up. And that's got um, a list of, of, I guess, like, at the moment it's got the paths to load up from the S2 disassembled um, uh, directory, but it um, should also, yeah, I'll, I'll be able to modify it to use offsets, so then it'll just index into the ROM. Never play Sonic 2, are these graphics on the game or your, own very, or your own versions? No, this is directly from the Sonic 2 ROM. This is completely, it's loading up the Sonic 2 ROM. Um, I mean, at the moment it's kind of, it's a disassembled Sonic 2 ROM, but it is loading up directly from the ROM. So this is all, you know, decoding um, the Mega Drive's, you know, sprite format, and then also its palette format, and then rendering it. So it's it's meant to be exactly like what um, the Sega Mega Drive or the Sega Genesis actually did. So that's my goal is actually like to make Sonic Two, but make it as close to Sonic Two as I can. And so I've got tile, I've got sprites being rendered. You can see here I've got some yellow stuff. Um, this yellow, like, they're like special animated sprites. The, the um, I think on the first level of Sonic, they actually had um, uh, the the flowers would move in that. So I've got that. Um, yeah. So basically, oh, the waterfall's meant to like there's meant to be palette shifting. So that's going to be tr tricky because on, on modern hardware, palette shifting is actually less efficient than what it used to be. Like palette shifting used to just I don't know. The, the, you could you could shift the palettes, and as it was render, you could actually like just change what's in memory, now it's, now it's a bit difficult. First time watching you, this is awesome, how long you've been programming Sonic 2? Um, I made, one thing that I did was, um, there's something in Sonic 2 called Kaczynski compression. Um, and about six months ago, I wrote Kaczynski compression. I implemented it correctly. Um, yeah, I should, sorry, I forgot to link the, forgot to link the repository, let me get that. Um, so I implemented something called uh, Kaczynski compression, which is one of the compression used in um, in Sonic. There's, uh, I think, two different. Yeah, Sonic Two has two different forms of compression. Thank you. Thanks for the, thanks for the link. 
Um, yeah, so it uses two different forms of compression. Six months ago, I wrote one implementation of one of the versions of, of it. Um, it was super, super slow. And so this week, um, I probably I probably spent about a week on, on doing that, um, implementing the compression, uh, just playing around at night. I probably spent like a week on that. Um, and then, yeah, this week I've been working on it a little bit as well. So it's basically taken me two weeks to get to to get to this, I think, because the compression was, was a little bit tricky, and it's a little bit detailed, but um, I, I implemented it, and then it was very, very slow, because I was using, losing lists. I just did a really simple version. Um, I just wanted to make sure that it was correct. Um, but yeah, I, I optimized it. Yeah, that, that check, checkable pattern actually is in Sonic 2, I'm pretty sure. I'm going to confirm that right now, but I'm pretty confident it is. Let's let's confirm. There we go. Yeah, it does have the checkerboard pattern. It's not an actual. It's not actually an artifact. That is actually how it's meant to look. It, it does look a bit weird, doesn't it? Yeah. So I've got I've got this. Um, so what I'm going to do? Um, I've got um, I've got tiles being rendered. So tiles are a version of um, of sprites. So basically, what I want to do is kind of like generalize this. Uh, Generalize the code a little bit because these tiles. Yeah, so the way it works is you've got chunks which are 128 pixels wide by 128 pixels tall. Um, inside of that you've got 16 uh, by 16. Uh, what do they call? They call them blocks. And then inside of that you've got cells which are 8 by 8 pixels. So you kind of you've kind uh, they keep getting smaller. So you got 8 by 8 and you combine them up into 16 by 16 and you combine them up into 128 by 128. I'm using SDL to draw the graphics. I just thought I'd use SDL. It's pretty good. Um, eventually, I would like to maybe even think about like trying to figure out if I. I've seen people do SDL and um and like GHC and compile it over to like Android and do ARM. I don't think that would be actually very complicated. So it'd be really cool if I got these on um got these on a uh, on like an Android. It'd be awesome. So anyway, I've got these eight by eight pixels that are being rendered and they, I, I think in my code I've called them cells or something, but they should be called tiles. So in, in Sonic literature, you usually see like um, chunks, blocks, tiles. And so I'm gonna actually generalize my tiles because tiles are actually just sprites. So I'm gonna generalize my, um, my goal is to generalize tiles to render sprites. So what I wanna do now is render Sonic, actually render Sonic. I am, I am loading the graphics from Sega's original files and then I'm rendering them to SDL. That's exactly what I'm doing. Anything you got? Try to do something with Android. Got the impression it's really annoying to do anything other than Java. I have seen like if you look, if you Google like GHC Android um, game, uh, someone has made a game and actually shipped it using yeah this one, this one here. So this Kira Studios. They've actually made a game that I think you can actually download on Google Play even. Yeah. And it, it, I think it's SDL and Android and uses GHC, so it's it's similar to to what I'm trying to do. I'm doing Haskell and and, and SDL, so hopefully we could compile it to, to Android and that'd be awesome. Uh, the distro that I'm using is called NixOS. I use Nix for absolutely everything. We use Nix at work, and I use it for absolutely everything. Um, managed for writing games in Haskell. Um, I think you do get um, most of the same um, benefits you get from from writing anything in Haskell. Um, there are some some you know downsides to, to doing in Haskell, but like I mean, the, a lot of this stuff I'm actually converting over um, Motorola sixty eight thousand uh, CPU instructions, so it's like there's a little bit of difficulty translating that to high, to high level Haskell. But um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, what my goal, right? This the way that I'm going to show off of, ha of Haskell in Sonic Two is I'm going to implement Sonic Two as close as I can to the original, um, and then I want to try and allow um, abstraction so that you can modify it. So if you don't like, I don't know, if you want to change tails, you should be able to write just a function to be able to change it. And that's that's how I want to show off of Haskell um, for writing games. Like I want to I want to show off that Haskell is really good at abstraction. And if we write our games in an abstract way, we can modify them to be whatever we want. That that's that's a bit of a goal that I have. I don't know how far I'll be able to get with that, but I'd like to really, I'd really like to do that. Um, I'm using no, I use NixOS for absolutely everything, like no virtual machines or anything. I just use NixOS. 
Um, I use NixOS for many laptops inside my house. Um, I use it for TV, like a TV thing, and then I use it for servers. I use it for absolutely everything. I don't use any other operating system other than NixOS. So this is this is running. I, what I do have is um, I've got like a little uh, what do you call it, like a X nested window type thing. So what you're seeing here is not my actual desktop, but um, it is kind of representative of how I work. Okay, so I want to load up um, Sonic. I actually want to get Sonic rendering. So I've got I've got um, the idea of rendering cells. I need to rename this to tiles because in Sonic literature it's actually tiles. Um, but we've got this idea of cells, and let me let me actually load up. Um, the Sonic uh, sprites. Where are they? So they are under. Whoops. Kitty. Okay, so they are under S2 Dissem. Uncompressed, they're uncompressed ones, so Sonic Sonic's art. I think that's what I want. Is it that? I think it might be that. Yeah, I think it's that. So I'm gonna load up this. Uh no, I'm not trying to avoid GC. I mean, it's a pretty old game, I should be able to do it without any performance problems. How is it worth switching from Linux right to right now using Fedora and Xmonitor to NixOS? Like, what what benefits does it give from a developer perspective? Okay, from a developer perspective, I'll show you. So I have um, I have up here Nix files. I'll talk really quickly about about Nix. We'll get back to Sonic in a second. So I've got my Nix files up here. Um, in here, I've got all of my configuration for a heap of different systems. Um, but this is how I configure my work computer, for example. So from a developer perspective, I can write um, code to specify my system. I don't have to, you know, I don't have this mutable thing. So I've got like a, these are actually just, you know, values that I can that I can specify. Um, like from a user, user perspective, I can roll back at any point. If I upgrade something or if I will try and run any programs that don't work, I can roll back um, and keep working. So it's good from a developer perspective if you don't want to slow down or anything. If you're installing a lot of software and that and you're, um, wanna, if you want to try like a kernel feature or, or anything, you don't have to be scared about, about doing that. You can just try things out. If they don't work, Nix has got rollback, so you can roll back. Um, but from a developer's p perspective, um, if you have Nix, I mean, this this isn't really um, specific to uh, to Nix OS, but um, actually, I need to get, I can get rid of that. Um, do I need to pull in my code? I might not have pulled in my recent code. Um, yeah, I'll fix that. So uh, one thing that um, that we can do is like specify um, development environments in Nix code. So here I've specified that I want, yeah, this is not the latest code, but anyway, um, what, I'm, what I'm saying here is give me, uh, like I want to run my Sonic 2 game, I want to run it, but give it Kosinski, which is not on um, Hackage. And then this, which is not on Hackage. So I'm able to like kind of, I'm able to make custom development environments. I'm able to override anything. So I don't have to rely on, um, like I don't have to say, hey, go off to GitHub and download this thing. I can just specify this. And so it's just code. So for managing development environments, I can just write code. That's why I use NixOS. You can run this this package manager, Nix, um, on, any, on any system. So you could actually use Fedora and Nix as well together. I go the whole way because Nix is so useful to me. I specify, I use this for development and we use this at Atlassian a lot, um, at least on my team. We use this for, for a lot. We use this for specifying development environments. We actually use this to deploy environments. We've actually got, if you go to um, Marketplace, this is deployed using Docker images onto our internal platform as a service, you, deployed using um, Nix. Nix builds the Docker images, uploads them and everything, and then we can just deploy. So we've actually got everything fully specified for Marketplace. And for uh, another development perk is that you can you can actually pin everything. So everything here is actually pinned. So if I wanted to build a new version of Marketplace, I wanted to update one little library, I can go through and do that. I don't have to be careful about updating everything. Or I, I don't ever have to worry about that. I've, everything is pinned. I know exactly what, what version of everything is going out there. There's no random binaries that come in or anything like that. So I, I highly recommend it for development. Um, I use it for absolutely everything though. Cool.
Can't next do the things the Docker images do by itself. Yes, but our internal platform as a service demands us to use uh, to use Docker. That, that's really the only reason that, that we would use it just because other like the deployment artifacts need to be Docker images. That's it. Awesome. Cool. Tried next OS, couldn't get a GUI loaded, didn't have time to research it. Yeah, that, that happens too. There, there's time that, that that happens. Okay. So uh, here's my actual default now. So there's actually, I, I realized that I probably should just use this for development. There's this develop package thing. It's not the greatest, but it works for development. So going with that. So here I'm saying I've got bounded array, which is a library I wrote yesterday. Seems to work pretty well. Uh, I can talk a little bit about that. That's actually, you know, there's actually some some stuff in there. Okay, let me get back to this. So I was trying to load up Sonic's art. Okay, I've got that. So um, if I render this now, so what I want to do, I want to actually render more sprites than just the tiles. I've got the tiles being rendered, but I want to render just you know random sprites as well. So I've got Sonic's art being loaded. So let me let me run this. I used to use Arch before I switched over to NixOS. Arch Linux is actually like, you know, like the runner up to what I would probably use. So now I've got Sonic's art being loaded and I've set it as the cell content, also known as like the tiles. So this should be like, you know, the, the eight pixels by eight pixel blocks that you see, that'll be this. Doesn't, oh, I've got to add S2 dis, uh, S2 dis as an, cool, oops. So what you should see now is probably a bit freaky, but uh, it should be Sonic's art being loaded up as the 8x8 pixels that the level uses to render itself. So you should be able to see like Sonic's head and things. There you go. So these are little bits of Sonic being rendered as the level now. So instead of actually, you know, like the level pixels, you can see here, that's Sonic's eyes. Uh, you can probably see his legs around here somewhere. There's these spikes and stuff. So these are actually like Sonic's individual 8x8 pixel uh, little things being rendered as a... Uh, as the level content. So instead of the actual level pixels, we've got, we got Sonic being put everywhere. But you can see the colors are off because this is, you know, chemical plant zone. So it's using the chemical plant zone, I think. Uh, I think it's using chemical plant zones uh, colors. Yeah, I think that's the problem. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna change that real quick as well. So uh, let me go to palette index. So real quick, I'm just gonna modify this. So. Each, uh, each of those 16 by 6, 16 pixel blocks get to specify a uh, palette to use. So I'm just going to say use the first palette. The first palette in Sonic is always the uh, the uh, the actual Sonic 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 palette. You got four palettes when you modify when you're working with uh, Mega Drive. You've got the zero, one, two, and three. Hopefully this is right. No, that didn't work at all. Interesting. Oh, I don't think I've loaded up the palette. Okay, we can, oh no, there we go, I do have the palette in there, do I? No, I don't, okay, cool, we can do that as well. Yeah. Let me load up Sonic's palette. So I don't have Sonic, Sonic's palette as zero. So you got zero, one, two, and three as the palettes in the, in the Mega Drive. Um, each, so each level references, when, they, when you've got a 16 by 16 pixel uh, uh, block, a block gets to specify what palette to use in those eight by eight pixels. Art, art, yeah, art, palettes, I think. And what is the palette? Uh, there's Sonic and Tails. In. There we go. Sonic and Tails. In. Cool. And the first one in the palette, so you got one, two, and three basically for, for actual level stuff. And for Sonic stuff, well, the actual uh, Sonic character gets put in as the first one. So I'm just going to put this in as the, uh, the first palette, yeah. So, but maybe Sonic palette, and I'm going to add the rest of the palette, so the actual level palette on there. Um, oh, okay, and one hack I actually did to get this to work was actually I did um, load palette, because it wasn't originally loaded in the Sonic palette, so I need to fix that up. I realized this last night, so uh, instead of being... 
one to three, let's load it up into to pellets zero to three. Yeah, zero inclusive, yeah. Uh, what else stuff up there? Oh, whoops, I deleted some code by accident. What's this color scheme? This is um, called Solarized. Um, how do you quit Emacs? For me, it's QQ because I use a weird, weird system. Uh, okay, so color. So this should load up the right color palette, hopefully. Can you comment more on trust and mod actions for me? Use yeah, I can talk about that in a minute. Hopefully, I've got the right colors. Yeah, here we go. So you can see this is actually the the Sonic palettes are being loaded up now. So instead, so it, every um, you know, still rendering it in a weird, you know, like uh. <laughs> Still rendering it as a as a level, which it uh, yeah, which makes it look a bit freaky. But it's got the right palette now. So we're ignoring, we're actually ignoring like all the uh, all the palette information from the level, and we're just saying use the first palette, so which is the Sonic palette. So this is Sonic being loaded. So you can see that the cells, like tiles and cell, well tiles, are actually just sprites, and so we can load up sprites and render them. So I've got that logic there. I just want to generalize a little bit so I can actually render any icon, like any any actual sprite that I want to. So that'll load up. Um, that'll load up Sonic. Then we've got something called sprite mapping. So that's the next thing I'm going to have to do. So I want to generalize the code a little bit and then work on sprite mappings. Maybe I should write, work on sprite mappings first. I don't know. Um, so the modern transforming stuff I've used um, pretty much got. Um, just to monitor IO, which is what SDL gives. Um, so I could have specified, you know, give me IO. You probably can't see it there, but you, I could specify M to be IO, but then um, I could fix it to IO, but then I don't really like that. So I, I, I prefer to like propagate up the, uh, you know, the constraints that we have. So if SDL is saying, you know, use monitor IO, then then give back on monitor IO. Um, and then I needed some errors, so I just added monitor error, Sonic error, and I added my little Sonic error type and added it in. So that was like, I mean, really, it's just um, the one transformers I'm using is just I'm um, using MTL. I use MTL a lot, and I'm just uh, whenever I need a new feature, I just add a new constraint on, which is a really useful way to to work. Just adding constraints on rather than actually specifying what transformers and that I can just specify what constraints. And then down here somewhere I've got like run. Yeah, run except T, run root T. Of course, I'm just ignoring the errors, which is really dodgy. I should actually do something about it. But for now, I'm just ignoring the errors. This will just crash if anything goes wrong, which is not good. Yeah, so that's, I mean, that's my comment on one transformer use. Is there any, is there anything specific you want to know about it? I just, I've been just going, I've just been using MTL and just adding constraints whenever I need them, basically. I'm like, oh, I need error handling here. Okay, add on monad error, done. I'm just gonna add a binding for this. Cool. And I'm gonna delete that again, go back to using the actual level. And what we have now, we have Sonic's palette being loaded up as palette. Oops, what did I accidentally there we go. So we got Sonic's palette being loaded up as the first index. Like zero index zero. Doesn't cause you an avalanche of effect when you had a constraint deep down in the cool chain. Yeah, which is good. I, I think I see that as a good thing. Oh, I accidentally had this is chemical plant zone being rendered using uh, Sonic's palette. I accidentally, I accidentally did that. That's pretty cool. <laughs> oh, this is not chemical plant anymore. This is um, I, th I was a bit confused when I saw those circles. This is not chemical plant. This is um, what you call it, uh, Metropolis. That makes more sense. I, I, I did a get update and change change things. Sonic plan zone. <laughs> okay. Um, where are we going with this? So yeah, got pallet zero being loaded up and that's a Sonic pallet. Cool. So I will fix up my weird pallet index thing that I changed. 
make sure that we can still render it and then I will actually, I don't think I'm gonna um, generalize the layout thing right now. I th maybe I should. I know I'm a bit, I'm a bit conflicted because I have to, there's kind of two things to be able to get a um, sprite to work. One of them is a sprite mapping. I need to be able to load up a sprite mapping. Let me look at that. I haven't actually looked at the sprite mappings yet. So I actually don't know what, what this is doing. The search thing I'm using is, um, I think, projectile. Yeah, projectile. What's your method of choice for getting around the monad reader fun functional dependency and so on? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Getting around the monad reader functional dependency. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. I just, I mean, the way I would use monad reader is just adding monad reader. Are you talking more about creating instances for it? I'm not sure. So I don't know anything about the um, Sonic mapping. So what I'm going to do is um, Sonic Retro is a really good website. That's what we were using last week. So we were using this level editing thing. Oh, this is for Sonic. Yeah, this is Sonic Hedgehog 2. So it's got, this is the level editing. And what I want to do is there should be something, sprite mappings. There we go. So I need to basically implement this. First word, second and third word, fourth word. Okay. So I need to implement this. Um, sign to top edge. I'm not sure what this sign top edge means. Position, top, top edge position, signed top edge position. Oh, okay, so the top edge of the sprite from the center of the object. Okay, I'm not really sure what that means, but we can ignore that. Size of the sprite, that makes sense. Tiles minus one, okay. Because it's zero indexed, so it's tiles minus one. Four bits are ignored. Two bits control the width and the lowest control the height. Okay, so it tells you how many tiles it's made up of. Okay. Second, third word, one, second word is one player mode. Third applies to two player. So we don't actually need to care about third. We're not actually going to be worrying about two player second though. So that will be, okay. The, so this is something called um, a pattern, pattern ind index or pat, yeah, pattern index. So I, what I want to, like when I was talking about generalizing my tile information, I want to generalize this because, um, so this is the video display processor, I think it was called. I think that's what we realized last time. So Sega, Sega Mega Drive, Sega Genesis had something called a video display processor, which has like a big reference and you can you can look that up. Um, but it takes something called pattern indices. So that's what I, uh, a pattern index, sorry. And that's what I want to kind of, uh, when I was talking about generalizing the tile stuff, I wrote a lot, a lot of code to, to make tiles get rendered. And what I should be doing is generalizing it to anything that, that has like this pattern index. I should be able to render anything with a pattern index, take a pattern index and render a set of tiles basically. So that's kind of what I want to generalize. I want to be, be able to take this type of thing, this, this pattern index and cause it's got things like if you should flip the, flip the thing, um, what palette to use. So that's kind of like very general information. This is exactly the same as what I've already implemented it, except I've implemented it for, for blocks and tiles and I should be implementing it for sprites. So basically a block should be a sprite. That's what I'm trying to say. A block should be a sprite, really, like a, an instance of a sprite. So my generalization should be should be sprites, and blocks should just be sprites. When you have a reader T of int and a reader T of bool, and you want to use some code like write, you want to ask from both, you run into the fact that monad should determine the environment type. Yeah. Um, I think what you're talking about is something that I would use lens for. I'd use commit's lens library. Um, there's, what is it? Let me see if I can find it real quick. Um, so on the lens library, there is use. I've forgotten the ho there's a hotkey to do things in here, isn't there? I don't think it's up for lens, maybe. Oh, you actually have to go to one, don't you? So if we go to the index, there's this thing called users. 
Yeah, sorry, I don't think I've got Lens on, on Profunctable. I really need to fix that, especially since Komet's starting to use it. Also, like, uh, Komet was just streaming before me. If you, if you didn't come in, I, I think majority of you did come, come in from, from Komet, so thanks, Komet. But for anyone that didn't, go check out Ed Komet. Uh, he's eKomet on Twitch. So check him out. Um, yeah, he hosted me, and he's very good. He he made this library, basically. And he's streaming now, and he had, like, 100 viewers and that, so you should definitely watch, watch his stuff. Uh, didn't have lens on his lenderbot either. Okay, well, I'll fix it for him. I will get lens on 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 this lenderbot. So this use, uses monad state. I'm using that. If, uh, is it views? Is it yeah views? So you can actually um kind of like split it up. So I think what you're talking about is that if I had um, so I had one function that says uh, monad reader and it takes an int. Something like that, and then I had a y, which char. I think this is where you're going with it, and then I want z, which uses both. So I should be able to say do x and y. I should be able to use both, right? And so if I compile this, let me bring it into scope real quick. Z to be, I don't know, what do I want Z to be? That maybe. So it's kind of got this two things in scope. So what I would do is actually expand this to int and char, and then what do you do to do this? You do, um, you don't want really, you want, uh, oh, I've forgotten the lens for this. Yeah, I've forgotten the lens. Sorry, it'll take me a while to, to to be able to figure this one out. But you basically use a lens, so I could, should be able to say, should be able to combine it like that. Is it zoom? Thank you, zoom. That's what I'm thinking of. Zoom. Thank you. And is it magnif? Which point? Which function do I want? Magnify. Oh, zoom is for zoom. Oh, magnify. It's magnify. Yeah, magnify that you're thinking of. So magnify. I should be able to say magnify. Whoops. Magnify one x and magnify. I think that's right. Magnify two y maybe. Yeah. Zoom is for state. There we go. Uh, anyway, this is, uh, I don't know if I'll be able to get this to compile, but this is, this is the idea. I think this is solving your problem. Yeah, I'm not going to get this to work, but this is, this is the idea. This, this fixes your problem. I, I can't remember how to use it, but. That's that's the that's the tool you want. You want magnify. No, that's fine. That's fine. That's a good question. That's actually a really good question. I had similar questions when I started doing this. Uh, so there was a question about do you have lens as a compile dependency on this package? Yeah, I have lens on pretty much everything. When you're using Haskell mode to run compile build, I don't actually know how to do that. I use Dante, that gives me like syntax highlighting type, well not syntax highlighting, it gives me, um, it tells me the yeah, errors that aren't actually errors and then I restart and then it, then it fixes itself up. I don't, I'm probably not using Dante in a very well, good good way either. Uh, my my uh, integrations aren't, aren't the greatest. Can I just do Cabal build or something? Comma CB. Yeah, okay, that didn't work. That's why I don't do it. <laughs> That's why. 
So I do have lands as a dependency. There we go. So Kaczynski I wrote myself, Bounded Array I wrote myself as well, Mega Drive Palo I wrote myself, the rest are up on Hackage. Um, I will push these up onto Hackage when I actually have, when I actually know that they work pretty well. I think Kaczynski is probably good enough to go up there. Alright, where were we? Uh, we were, yeah, so I wanted to generalize the block loading and that, um, but I want to read the mappings, that's what I was trying to do, figure out the mapping. So, what's the mapping file? Each sprite consists of four words. Contiguous list of sprite mappings proceeded with a word length number of mapping defines a frame for an object. Yeah, I don't I, I I should add version restrictions, but I don't worry about it at the moment when I'm developing because I don't know what version restrictions to put on, so I just remove them all because Nick supplies everything for me and it just works, so I don't I don't know. I could just do a GC package list and probably, you know, at least, I need to at least bound them to like something similar to this so that if you are using the Cabal Resolver, you'll actually find something like this, but I haven't bothered yet. Um, I found out about a project called Tink. Tink is it? Yeah, Tink. Um, Tink's look, Tink looks pretty good. I don't know, like, so Tink actually goes the other way. I think if you give it a Cabal file, it can generate Nix code for you. So if you want to, to resolve specific versions, it'll automatically go off and resolve those for you using Nix. So I wonder if Nix, if Tink can do something similar, but in the reverse. I want to, I want to know what, to, what, um, I don't think it can. I want to know what, what bounds to put on, but anyway. Yeah, develop package, I think, basically ignores it all. Oh, actually, no, so it's not ignored if I said I want Kaczynski greater than 2. Um, and I come over to, like, when I do develop package, it gives me the give me the, gives me the version, but when I do a Nix shell, I think, like, I won't actually take into consideration that I've asked for number 2, and then if I go build, it should say error. Yeah, there you go. So, I mean, you do get you do get errors when you go to build. It does say, I need greater than 2. So, like... The develop package itself doesn't take into consideration that. It just supplies whatever it's got. If it's got Kaczynski 01, it'll supply it. But when you go to a Cabal build, it'll actually, you know, still give an error. So that it can it can still be useful to have to have bounds on things, just in case you know that a version in Nix that Nix is going to supply isn't going to work. So it is still useful to have bounds, just I don't I don't have that, that use case at the moment. Okay, um, yeah, this looks a bit involved. Um, what I might try and do is just generalize my code. Let's actually let's actually get something done. So I'm gonna actually try and just generalize my um my cell stuff. Cells. So I'm gonna rename this to tiles. Yeah, I'm gonna do that. I use GCID sometimes as well, which is useful. If it's not working right now for some reason. Oh, so I have renamed something. So GHCID just, uh, it's just a Cabal REPL and every time you modify a file, it'll just reload it. So it just, it's a really, really quick way of getting errors in. So I can see here that I need to modify main.hs. And then I should say, like before I even switch the window over, it's already, uh, it's already compiled. So I'm gonna save switch, all good. So you can see it's like, it's very, very fast compiling. Um, that's because it uses this, uh, I don't know if you saw it, but it uses this thing here somewhere, which is F no code. So it actually like doesn't actually compile any code. It just does type checking. So that's why it's really fast. Have you tried stack? Yeah, I've used stack. Um, I've tried using it and it doesn't, it doesn't work at all. Um, I, part of the reason is I use Nix. Um, I use Nix OS. So like 
a lot of the packages stack wants to use don't like they just don't exist on Nix. You kind of have to so then you have to kind of get try and tell Nick uh, stack to use Nix, and then it doesn't quite work either. And so it's just better to just use Nix. I mean, if you're on Nix OS, just use Nix because stack doesn't doesn't work on it. Um, a lot of my coworkers don't run Nix, but they they don't run Nix OS, but they like they run Max on that, and they still have problems with stack. So I uh, I've had a lot of classes where like I try and get people to. To, to write code and we've been just debugging stack so I always advise people not to use stack just because I spent so I've wasted a lot of time time working with it and I always find it easier if you're on a Mac just get GHC and Cabal and you can do everything that I that I work on like I teach a lot like I teach a lot of Haskell at work so um like I pretty much just need GHC I don't need Cabal even just GHC so like it's usually a lot easier to get people to install GHC and then from there can can kind of get people to do um get people to to do Haskell just using that. So that I, I usually just get people to use GHC if they come into my classes. I don't tell people not to use Stack because I've just had a lot of problems with it. Yeah, you get reproducible builds with Nix for sure. Yeah, it's yeah. So a lot of the benefits you like with, with Stack is meant to give give you like a version of GHC, and I I don't need that because I use Nix. So I mean the the problem with Nix is that there there is a big learning curve. Like if you saw my configuration dot Nix before, uh, was it here? No. So my Nix files, you can see that my configuration dot Nix is not like I mean you have to know you have to learn a new language to be able to configure your system. So it's like. There is a learning curve. Like you do have to, you do actually have to invest time in learning it. I, I highly recommend investing that time. It's paid off for me a lot, but it is an investment. So you just have to recognize that. Like it's not like stack where you just the investment is you run a you you install it and then you you build. Um, but Nix definitely hundred percent works and it is, um, it is very very good. Just uh, it just needs it just needs learning. You do need to learn it. Okay, so I've got that. I'm gonna commit that. And um, this is a really good thing in Emacs. A lot of a couple of people are like, uh, uh, I guess, uh, checking out my uh, configuration here, and I use Maggot. Probably meant to be pronounced Maggot. I don't know, but it's um. Let's me interactively, like you know, st uh, stage things. I really like Maggot; it's very good. Um, and what else do we do? We renamed. Okay, we wrote our first line of code today. Cool. Something you wanted to try out, never had a chance to try it. It's 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 it actually is it's very good. You know, you can interact like you just saw there I um I reviewed my thing and I just interactively kind of went, Oh that's that's uh you know, I don't want to I don't want to have that code anymore. I wrote that flexible instances thing, a flexible context thing and I was able to just delete it with, with one key, which is really cool. Yeah, Nix has um pre built Haskell packages, so you get um caching, yeah. Which is another thing on stack stack on Nix OS you don't get any caching. Um, you get caching when you build things and you go to rebuild if you go into if you build something and then you go to rebuild the same thing again stack won't which is good um, but you don't automatically download things uh, like if you want to if you if someone else has built something and you want to uh, you want to have exactly the same thing you, you, it doesn't do that that's something that Nix does you can actually cache things Nix can cache things so you can actually ship your you can actually have your own cache server or there's some, there's like the main Hydra server, so that which is like the main, uh, the people that manage Nix cache a lot of things, and all of Haskell by default is cached, which is pretty cool. Is my space max file on GitHub? No, um, it's not. Uh, there's nothing too interesting in there, but there is some passwords and stuff in there, so which there probably shouldn't be, but there is. Um, I can put a chunk of it on there, I guess. It's not very. It's really not very interesting. Yeah, all of Hackage is cached. Yeah, that's right, which is awesome. Uh, there's nothing really interesting in my Space Max. Hopefully, if I load this up, you won't see any passwords or anything. Cool. Uh, lucky and 
don't know. Like, really, all I've done is just enable to hit the layers, and that's pretty much it. Um, and half of these I don't even use. I do use, like, you know, syntax checking, version control. I do use a few of these, but most of these I don't. I don't even know why Python's in there. I don't use Python. It's probably for some Ansible or something. Uh, this is one thing that is useful though. I use Dante. Dante is really is good for um like by default I think it uses I, don't, I can't remember what it uses, but there's there's Intero and then there's Dante. And Dante is well this is yeah here we go Dante. So Intero um Intero is like built on stack and Dante um is a fork of Intero but removes the reliance on on stack. So it can use stack but it doesn't have to. Um, it basically gen tries to generalize things a little bit, and I, I don't know, maybe some things break then or not, I don't know. But um has no dependencies on stack, but it does allow you to... Yeah, it works if you've got GHCI, basically. So um, like it it's got built-in support for Nix and that. So like if you open up a thing and it's got a Nix shell, it'll automatically start the Nix shell, find GHCI, and then start loading code in there. So that's why Dante, over here, you can see when I make a, make a mistake, I actually get an error. And that's because Dante Dante is running. I mean, that was just a pause error, but let's go. Um, I should get a type error here, and that's because Dante is running. And so it opens up the Nix shell, has all of my dependencies included in that. So you don't have. So yeah, it's good. I I, I like Dante a bit. Um, there's some problems where like you try and open up things and it doesn't have a good shell, and so it just kind of. Doesn't it just gives you a big red arrow and says, "Hey, you didn't have a good shell, so I broke." And you have to restart it every now and then, which is annoying as well. But anyway, miss about the prelude. Oh, did I miss you talking about which prelude you were using? I'm using. Um, you did miss that because I didn't talk about that because I'm just using um, Haskell base prelude. I'm not using anything anything interesting. Um, my prelude is basically lens, though. I just import lens a lot. Um, I spent like I spent a lot of months getting really good at lens. Um, obviously, I'm not that great because I wasn't able to remember magnify. Um, but I, I did invest some. I just did like intentionally uh, invest some time in learning lens, and it really paid off. Lens is very very good. Uh, so we've got tiles, and I want to generalize this to sprites. Um, actually, I want to generalize this to not just like so. I've got my Sonic Two repository. I want to actually generalize this a little bit more to um like I've got my uh, I think I've got Mega Drive palette here yeah Mega Drive palette so I get Mega Drive palette so I have like a separate repository for uh, for loading up palettes and I want to do something similar for sprites like I want to be able to load up sprites and be able to get um, like load up a uh, palette indexes and or indices and an index into them so it's like I kind of want to separate this into a different repository if I if I can. But anyway, I'll, I think I'll just write the code and then I'll split it off because it should be easy after that. Uh, what were you using before Dante? Were you using uh, Intero or something? All of this is a little bit, I don't know, I've got word aids and I've got lists and I've got arrays and stuff. It's all a little bit of a mess, but it does work. Trying to learn lens, I tried for a while. Now you have to start your first job next week. It's F sharp. Le learning lens takes quite a bit of time, which you don't have. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, it, it does It does take some time. Um, it has really paid off for me. Um, I use lens. I, I actually did a talk a while ago, which was... um. At Compose, Melbourne, I think it's Compose, Melbourne. I think it was maybe Optics. Jeez, okay. Didn't thought that one would be. Here we go. Productionization of functional opt optics. So I talked about, um, I actually did optics in Java, Scala, Haskell, and PureScript. And those are all, all things that I've actually shipped code with and using, using op functional optics and using basically, I don't know, Lens what the lens library provides basically. Um, and so I have ship code in Java that uses lenses. And so if, you, if you're doing F-sharp, um, you will be able to ship code using lenses and it will be a useful thing for you to learn. Um, but it, it does take, take some time to learn. But I mean, if you learn just like the core idea of optics, um, it, it does pay off in any code that you're working with. 
Yeah, Micro Lens is pretty good. Small Library is pretty good. Is Dante better than Intero? Um, I use, I really like Dante because it works with not just stack and I don't use stack. So, I mean, that that's basically the reason why, why I use it. Please paste the li link. Sure, I'll paste a link to my video here. Yeah, cool. Here it is. Is that what you're talking about? Hopefully you talked about that. Um... Yeah, cool. Um, where was I? Uh, yeah, I, I use Dante just because it works with more than just stack and I don't use stack. So, I mean, that's really the motivation for me. If you, if you use stack, I don't, I don't know. I don't think, I don't, know, I don't know if it makes much sense. Okay, so um, I'm gonna make, so this is tile, but I'm actually gonna change this to, um. Loading sprite surface. I kind of don't like Monodio, it seems like a bit of a hack, but it works. Any reason why I've got Windows zoomed in so much? It's because I um, I actually do this in like a nested window. Um, outside of this, I've actually got two like massive, massive monitors. Um, I can't really stream effectively because I've got many, many pixels. I don't know how many pixels I've got. I've got like, Alaskan gave me like two massive, I think they're 24 inch monitors and I've got like a big resolution on them and that. So like I can't effectively stream my whole screen um, so I like have a little nested screen and so I kind of played around with what's the best size to stream at and some people hate this because they have big monitors as well but some people like this so I, I don't know like I'm sorry if this is annoying to you I'm sorry if you hate um, if this feels really zoomed in or something um, on my screen it's not on my screen it's absolutely tiny there's a little tiny little part of my screen so I, I don't I don't have awful eyesight or anything um, it's just that um, It's just that I, I, it's just an effective way for me to, to do it. And it also, um, what I like about it is that it also contains things like, I've got things outside the window that you can't see, um, that I can see, which is good. Helps me out a little bit. Okay, that's good. Some people, some people are coming here and being annoyed at me for, for having such a, such a weird resolution thing, so. Well, it's, it's not okay. Cool. So, it's, it's, if it's not annoying to you while watching, it's not. It's definitely not annoy, annoying to me because it's very small on my screen. Um, I've only got like, I think it's like I, I can't remember what, what resolution I have, but yeah, I, I purposely did this just so um, so people can see. So that's good. Okay, so I've got this um, sprites surface function. Right surface. So the thing I want to do is also I do want this split by it, and then I do want chunks of. I think so. I actually do want most of this. I think I do want most of this. Uh, so this is giving me right. The, uh, the way that um, sprites work is that there are they're eight by eight, and what else? They're eight by eight, and they're um, each they're eight by eight pixels, but each one is like made out of a byte. Yeah, because I got this split byte, right? So every byte becomes two bytes. So when it comes in here, I'm actually reading uh, just part of a byte. I'm reading half a byte. So I feel like I should move that into into my sprite thing. I'll, I'll move this function in a way. I don't know. 
I don't, know if I, I don't feel like I should expose this because it's really. Yeah, I'm gonna expose that for now. I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna move on a little bit. Actually, I think um, what I'll try now is sort of block. I've got this idea of like a palette index and that, so I'm, I think I might do this. I've got this copy cell, so I'm gonna do copy tile. session not going to be copy tile even that's going to be copy sprite I think that's going in the right direction uh, let me talk about bounded array because I, I wrote that yesterday and I'm I don't know, I'm kind of conflicted on it, I guess. You can see I do a lot of like, uh, I forgot what you call this, like uh, imports that uh, I specify the imports. So I'm importing a test bit and shift L I think it was. Shift R was it? Shift R. Would I consider a parsec style library to be overkill for passing simple strings. Parse potentially arbitrary nested string in the form. No, um, I would not. Uh, there is a reason. Where does vector come from? Oh, I have to hide vector. Um, no, in fact, I, I, I do things like that a lot. Um, what a lot of people would probably use something like, I mean, I don't know if you can, you probably can't even do that one with regex now you can't do that one with regex um, but a lot of people in most other languages will use uh, regexes for things like that even though they can't like people try and use regexes whereas like uh, people when they write Haskell seem to instead of using regexes for everything they'll use parser combinators and I think that's absolutely fine I would definitely use something like pars parsec to be able to, to, pip, to parse like that to parse that thing I am making a game and I'll show you which game in one second. Let me run it right after this. Uh, so let me just make sure this is... Oh, cool. It's compiling. Let me run it for you right now. Whoops. I need to uh, modify my uh, compile file, but... This is running my 2D game. I am making a game, a 2D game, proper 2D. I don't know if you've ever played Sonic the Hedgehog before, but this is Sonic the Hedgehog. I am uh, reading in the Sonic the Hedgehog 2 ROM, and I am rendering the art from it. So I'm, re I'm using the actual palettes, I'm loading up the palettes, I'm loading up all the actual pixels, and I'm re rendering it. So this is actually loading up Sonic 2 ROM and rendering it using Haskell. Uh, so Sonic understands. There's a little bit that's involved, like, there's a little bit involved in that um, I have to understand a little bit about how the Mega Drive works. Um, actually, what's, what's interesting about this level is it actually loops. That's actually something pretty interesting. So, if you go up to the top of the screen, like, so if you go up and up and up and you take this screw all the way up, so you can actually, there's a little nut that meant, that's meant to go over this and, it, and, you, and you go up it. So you go up the bolt and when you come, you actually come up from the bottom. So there's actually like a teleportation thing. When you hit here, it actually loops back over the level actually loops. So that's something interesting that we're going to have to do as well. Um, but yeah, basically it's cool power. So yeah, I've got a disassembled Sonic 2 ROM in this repository, which is a little bit, uh, I don't know, it's a little bit dodgy, um, but no one's ever done anything about it. It's been up on there for years and people have been working on it. So people disassemble the ROM and they modify the ROM in different ways. I'm just reading in the ROM um, and and using it. Um, at the moment I'm reading it like the disassembled ROM has got like, uh, if you go S2 disassembled ROM, like this is actually a skip sub module and it's got like the art and that as separate files. And so I'm just loading up the files. 
Um, yeah, it's true. I'm not, I'm not distributing it. That, that's definitely true. Um, someone else is kind of distributing this disassembled ROM, and I'm just, I'm just making use of it. Um, but yeah, it's got all these um, files, and these are all just like it's the it's ROM, but it's all cut up. So there's someone's come in here, and I think if you um, there's a file here somewhere that's like actually like the uh, maybe this one. Yeah, so this one kind of like says uh, where things are. So this actually says like um. Uh, I don't know, this is the art for certain things. Basically, it tells you what, what offset into the ROM to get things from. So when it assembles things up, it actually just copies the data from here into into this offset. So when it assembles, like you can actually go in here and run make and it'll assemble your, assemble your ROM. I've never done it, but it'll actually assemble your ROM and copy the data that is in these files and put it into, into these locations. So what I'm going to do eventually is be able to load up an actual Sonic 2 ROM instead of a disassembly one, load up a Sonic 2 ROM by actually just, you know, using this index instead of this path. Would you expect to be able to use Parsec in an interview setting though, or would you quickly write your own tiny Parsec component library to solve a question like that? Um, like to use a Parsec component library, you pretty much need to know applicative and monad. That's mostly, oh, alternative as well which is, you know, kind of like a fork off applicative. So I would, um, like in an interview setting, would you be able to use Parsec? Um, like, because, because Parsec is basically applicative, alternative. Um, if I was hiring for someone that, to have like a bit of experience with Haskell, I would probably expect them to be able to use Parsec, yeah. Hopefully that answers that question. I would, I would probably expect someone to, to, to be able to use it, yeah. Okay, so there's that. Um, is there a question I missed? I think I might have missed a question, sorry. But we will add this file that's complaining about to... What file is complaining about? Does Oh, sprites, obviously, sprites. All right, so this one loads up sprites and it renders it, cool, okay. this because I've got rid of oops so this one's now going to be copy sprite which is going to come from which I'm going to export copy sprite and then over here somewhere Actually, read the warnings because me. So I can actually run GCID with Cabal Oracle. I want GC option. I want GC option. I could add this to my Cabal file. That's probably what I should do. But maybe I should just run things like this. Okay. So this is telling me all the warnings. I usually I, I usually make sure to get rid of all warnings. Actually, I, it's not even usually. I do every time I get rid of warnings. That's what I was going to do. I was talking, going to talk about bounded in a second. Cool. So we can get rid of uh, foreign C types. Foldable from where? Foldable from here? No, I'm using it. From tiles. worrying about main because I've got some stuff in main that I don't want to delete but it's there uh, just unused okay so this so I've got sprites as a separate kind of thing now so I should be able to say like um, what I want to do now is I guess like load up a sprite if you're giving someone a Haskell interview question with someone like something like Parsec was an easy choice for solution would you allow the use yeah absolutely 100% every time yeah I, I don't have a problem with people using Parsec. I wouldn't probably not expect them to quickly write their own Parsec style helper functions. No, I probably wouldn't. I mean, it'd be nice if they could, but I, I wouldn't expect it. No. Not not in an interview. Like it, it 
you know, give him a couple of days and, and maybe I would expect that, but not, not an interview. So I want to talk about my, uh, that's, that's my bounded, bounded, let me clone it out over here. I've got a separate repository, a separate uh, window over here. That's actually, I'll just kill my agent. So I'm just uh, getting my agent to work. Here we go. Okay, so I should be able to, um, I was playing around with Miso recently to help someone out, and Miso was really cool. Um, what was it called? What did I call it? Uh, Bounded Array. Sorry, I feel like I've got a window opening up. Yeah, to ask me my password. There we go. What's going on with this? There we go. Cool. Okay. So I've got this bounded array. I want to talk about that. I'm already yesterday. I'm not sure. I don't know. If someone can give me some, if someone can like help me out with this, like that'd be great. Um, like I, I don't actually need help with code. I just need to know like, is this a reasonable thing? So um, I made this thing called a bounded array, and you can see the instances there. But the uh, it's an array with something called an integral in index. An integral index is something where the, you can index it, index it as long as the index is integral. Um, and what's interesting about that is um, I use that to like kind of compute, you know, this range and stuff. Um, but because I've because because the the, uh, the index is integral, it means that I can um, uh, I'll also add on the bounded constraint and then I can have like an array that um, is always filled like from everything So usually an array when you create an array in Haskell, you've got like um, you say list array You say 0 to 10 and then you give it like I don't know 10 elements 0 1 2 3 you give it up to 10, right? So that gives me an array Let me open up in GHCI and we'll see what that looks like uh, So I can load up delta dot array and there you go, we've got like 10 elements inside of an array, cool. If I give it nine, you can see exception. If I give it nine elements, I get exception. So it's possible to like say that you've got this bounds and then not fill it in. But another thing you can do is right, you've got like zero to, um, so you've got zero to 10, that's fine. But then what if you access 11, an exception. So you've got exceptions here and you've got exceptions here. So there's kind of like unsafety in this. You've got exceptions where you, it's possible to not fill in every element. And it's also possible to index out of the bounds. And what I came up with was a bounded array, which says that I have an element for every single... Oh, thank you, Soding. Thank you so much. Thanks for the array. That's awesome. Um, so what, um, what it says is that... Um, you are saying that... Um, you are filling... You've got an, you've got an element for every, um, every possible index. So that's what that's what I've made. So uh, let me like tell tell me if this makes sense or if this is a useful thing. I, I could not find or if if it exists, please tell me if it exists. I wish this existed. I couldn't find anything online. So if you know that this exists somewhere, that'd be awesome. Um, so if I come in here and I say like list, so I've got a couple of functions. List array fill is one of them. Um, so I should be able to say list array fill, and I want to fill it up with zeros. Now what you have to do is tell it what type of um that, that's, that's kind of what's different here. So you saw here it was defaulting to int when I made like a list array, it was defaulting to int. But here uh, when I do list array fill, it is not going to give any defaults because I have to tell it what uh what kind of bounded thing to use. So I want to say like word eight. Uh, let me import word eight. And so now I have to give it a bounded thing, and so I can say word eight. And so you see here that this is an array where every index of my word eight. So every word eight has got a value. So it's actually a value of 255. So if I tried and accessed anything here, so I could try and access 20, it's got a value. It's not possible for me to, to crash this. Like it's not possible. There's no more exceptions. So bounded array gets rid of exceptions. And that's my goal was to, was to get rid of exceptions. And another benefit, it wasn't actually my, my goal, my, my original goal, but Another benefit is it actually gets rid of um, bounds checks. You don't actually, I can use unsafe at. So even though I've supplied like this exclamation mark and it indexes into it, I can actually use unsafe at, so which just computes a value and then accesses it. So usually unsafe at, if I 
So up here I had um, 11, right? So if I say unsafe at, you can see it crashed. So we actually do um, bounds checking so that we don't get seg faults. But because um, it's not possible to get a seg fault because there's always an element because my thing's bounded, um, I'm actually able to use unsafe at, which is just a little bit quicker. It doesn't have to do bounds checks. So I've actually eliminated bound checks by, by having this interface. Um, so this is a library I made. Um, it removes bounds checks, so it's a little bit faster technically. Um, and it's also safe because it's not possible for you, it's not possible for you to seg fault because you've got an element for every uh, index in this array. So that's that's what a bounded array represents. So something that is bounded and something that's integral. So like things like Word eight, int sixty four, like any of those type of type of, uh, even int, anything that um, that's fine to kind of lay out in a memory um, uh, in terms of like a Word eight or a Word sixteen or whatever. Um, then you can, and, and you've got like a fast access, fast indexing. Is the array lazily evaluated? What if you want a list array filled with a larger type? It won't create an array of four byte elements, will it? Um, that's a great question. I thought by default, uh, I actually haven't used arrays in Haskell very much. I've not really had to do that before, um, really before before writing, writing Sonic. And so my understanding was that arrays were, were lazily evaluated, but now you're making me second guess myself. Non-strict arrays, yeah, it is, okay. So they are lazy, they are lazy arrays. What if you want a list filled with a larger type int, want to create an array of four byte elements, will it? Um, it will, yeah, and I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that for how, like uh, the things I'm loading, well, yeah, it will. If you wanted to create an array with say a thousand elements, would you make sense to make an int new type with a custom bound instance? Yes, it would, it would. Can you have a bounded array of Word64? Let's try it, I mean, let's see what happens. If, if, I mean, let's see it. Uh, what am I doing? Uh, list array bounded, a oh, list array fill. So let's fill that with zeros. Give it nothing and we want it as a bounded array of Word. What do we say, Word64? I mean, there's also, we could import large words. Have you seen, if you've seen large words before, it's pretty cool. Uh, large words is a package as, I think it's called large words. No? Large word. It goes up to 200, word 256, so that'd be interesting. Uh, Word 64 of, I don't know, can we do unit? Why does it need to have that as the, oh, right. You've crashed my code. <laughs> that shouldn't happen. That's bad. That's interesting though. I guess I'm overflowing or something somewhere. That's really interesting. Oh, because I've got a word 64. I think the index has to be, yeah, the index has to be an int. That's really good. Thank you for this. This is awesome. Um, I found a bug in this, this, this thing. That's very good. Because uh, the, 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 I'll explain the reason, which is um, arrays use int. And the way I'm calculating the index is basically using from integral. And so what I think is happening is that it's using from integral zero from integral this, casting it to an int, and then trying to index using that, and then it's stuffed up. Um, so that's actually really interesting because uh, arrays have to use int as, as the uh, as the index. And so I think here in the Word64 case, like even though int and Word64 technically are the same size, um, I think the logic to compute the index from it, because we're using from, integr from integral, it breaks that. So that's a good test case. I'll try and figure out a way to, t to fix that up. Um, I haven't been really been worried about that. I've been worried more about word eights. Um, but thank you for that. Thank, thank you for that question. And it's good that we tried it out. Yeah, basically because one signed. Yeah, and because you when you do from yeah, is, that's exactly the problem. When you do from integral and you minus the difference and that, and then you try and put it into an int, it'll be a problem. Have to use inclusive range. Don't know about that. High DPO high DPI is only for you, not for me. Uh, it's you know normal. It's very normal looking on my screen. It looks a bit weird for you. Where's the hedgehog? Let me. So I haven't got the hedgehog actually. 
compiling the, uh, the actual... I've got the level. I have the hedgehog levels, but I don't have the I don't have him rendering yet. So that's that's the next goal is to render him. Okay, so this is the levels. I have this rendering. So one thing I, I'd like to actually see is um so palette shifting, like I was saying before, is not very efficient on mo modern hardware because um and there's a couple of ways to like palettes used to be just you know you used to shift the index around, um, and now when you've got textures, you kind of bake in the colors into the textures. And so they're not very efficient anymore. What we could do though is use um, a pixel shader and we can actually like, you know, index into the pixel shader and then modify the palette like that. So um, there actually is a way to kind of do it efficiently, just not how you would usually use textures and stuff in a game. So that is what I would like to play around with using palette, like writing a shader for palette shifting. That'd be pretty cool. Um, I, I've never done anything with shaders in SDL either though. So I don't, I don't know about that. Um, another way to do it is just bake in all the cycles just bake in all the cycles and have a separate texture for every cycle and that would probably be just fine. I mean, it would use up a little bit more video memory, but we're playing Sonic. It's not going to take up a much video memory on a modern computer, is it? So that's another thing. I was thinking about just doing that just because it would work everywhere. I wouldn't have to write like a cross-platform pixel shader. I know that there's a little bit difference between like pixel shaders on a desktop and um, on mobile. I know that there's a little bit of difference. That's what I'm a little bit worried about that, but anyway. I shouldn't really be worrying about mobile, I should be just worrying about this. Um, yeah, so I have to... So I'll, I'll fix up the bounded library anyway, but I mean, I thought it was pretty good that I got... Um, I mean, the way that I'm using it, I'm using only using for Word 8s, it kind of sucks that it broke for Word 64, so I'm going to kinda have to think about that. Um, you don't want to create an array the size of max bound anyway, so I don't think that bug matters much. Yeah, exactly, you don't want to use int anyway, yeah. I mean, it, I agree, it doesn't really matter much, it does suck that it crashes though, because that's kind of what I was avoiding. I, I completely agree. It's just, it just kind of sucks. Yeah, you don't you don't want to you don't want an array the size of an int, like the size of max bound int, which is whatever it is. We actually had what we did there was actually max bound of uh, word sixty four, which is that you don't want an array of that many elements. So it it doesn't matter, but um, it just kind of sucks, yeah. Maybe it's fine. Maybe I should just, in the documentation, don't create massive, massive arrays. I don't know. Um, okay, where was I going? Um, okay, so I've got the... So, uh, um, I have this thing load tiles. And it loads up tiles in a... So this should actually be like load sprite, I think. So I think everything in tiles actually should be pretty much sprite. I think what I did before is I copied some code out of tiles. But I think actually this is like just general sprite information. I think that's accurate, actually. I'm actually going to rename this uh, from tile to sprite. Hmm. Yeah, let's do that. I'm actually going to copy this code back in, undo exactly what we just did before. I've just been thinking about it a little bit more just then, and I think what we want is it all in here in this section. So this tiles thing just needs to be sprites. Because the tile really is just a sprite. So this is going to be sprites. You can see, yeah, here's, here's bounded array. So I'm using about an array word 16. Uh, the biggest one I think is a word uh, word 16, but even that's fine. Pokemon come from. It wasn't 
for me. What's up? No. Oh, it's a uh, array store. Hey, Weechley, how's it going? Thank you for the host. Poke them off. Oh, where is it? God, I'm gonna have to use Google. Four installable. Uh, okay. Why array are rather than vector? Um, just because I don't have to. I don't have to have many of the operations of array. That's all. I mean, sorry, of vector. Um, I, I don't have to concatenate things or anything like that. Thank you, Weechley. Thanks for coming in. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, have a good sleep. I think it's a bit early or late for you. So, yeah. I, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm guessing it's a bit, uh, bit late. Just um, like vectors, like have like I mean, like a, a, a vector is is an array, but with operations that make it less like an array. Um, the only reason we use a like I mean the the way that we use array in here um, is just to index into things, just to get bytes out. Yeah, array is bounded. Uh, it's sorry, the name might be a bit confusing. It's it's arrays are bounded. Um, but what I meant by bounded was actually the bounded type class. So like when we have uh, when I when I when I made that name, I actually was trying to reference this bounded type class. So you actually like every all the all the methods on um, my bounded array thing uses this bounded type class. So that's kind of what I was meant to be representing. Like you 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 are when you have an array you're actually filling it in for the whole bounded, so you actually got min to max. That's, that's what I was meant to be, you know, referencing. So it's fully, it's fully, like, I mean, really I should call it like a total array or like a, a uh, covering array or something like that. Maybe covering array is probably a better name, I don't know. People don't get confused, because arrays are, they do, do have bounds, so you give it a minimum and a maximum, yeah. Sorry, you've just been seeing me screwing around with imports for a while. It's a bit boring. More like fixed fix size array. Yeah. You're, you're very welcome to uh, come up with a name. I'm, I'm, I hate naming things, so. Okay, so we've got sprites being loaded. Okay, so this is not, well, I guess it's not really sprites. It's kind of like parts of a sprite, so I guess that's a bad, bad thing as well. Um, yeah, it's bad as well. They actually are tiles. One of, my goal is to generalize it into into sprites because what I've got here is in my blocks a block becomes a sprite oh here we go okay so that does actually so that is right okay okay so this one is not a sprite surface this one's actually a tile surface so this one is actually load tiles and here is copy sprite. So this one actually combines tiles into sprites. Okay, where I was going before was probably a better direction. Load tiles, copy sprite. I think what I was trying to do before was actually the better direction. I think I've gone in the wrong direction for a while. It's fine. Um, and so now if we go back to main after undo what I just did. Okay, cool. So we've got load tiles, copy sprite. Always full array, exactly, yeah. So 
Sorry, I'm, I'm undoing exactly what I just did. This is really annoying, sorry. It's probably not very good viewing. Me screw around with imports over and over again. So I'm probably just gonna ignore that for now. Uh, I'm not using a mechanical one. I hate mechanical keyboards. I, I can't stand them. Um, it's just uh, it's one of those Microsoft ergonomic ones. One that's really standard Microsoft uh, ergonomic. I forgot what you call it. Ergonomic 3000 or something like that. There's a thousand in it or something. Um, it probably sounds like a mechanical one because I guess the, the microphone is very close to the keyboard. Yeah, I reckon that would be the problem. Okay, Sprites has got copy. Hang on, let's mix that up. Oh, there we go. This is magical task, as well. There we go. Okay, compiling again. We're back to basically where we started. Okay. So this loads up, loads up a tile, and that's fine. Tiles are good, and then tiles get assembled into sprites, and that's good too. That actually makes a lot of sense. Cool. Okay. And there's a little like you can see this is a little bit. You know, a little bit detailed. Like we get the palette index, and then we have to have to do things with that, and then we have to flip it, and that's a little bit in involved in SDL. So SDL's got this idea of surface and texture. Textures are hardware, so they're on on the graphics card, and surface is like a, a software thing. So surfaces are basically just like an array, a two D two dimensional array of 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 uh, of of words. Um. I guess 2D, 2D array of colors would be what a surface is, yeah. I mean, in the implementation, it's like an array of, of certain vectors or of a word or something like that. Oh, it depends on how you're actually indexing it. So you can actually index it. So the way that we've got it is a, it's a word eight because we're indexing, we've got like a indexed palette on it. So if you come up here, you can actually see that we've got, um, it's a, uh, yeah, we were saying index eight. So we're actually saying that the colors are, are a palette. And so this is what we're doing here. We're actually saying set the palette colors to be, um, to be whatever's in our palette index. So we actually can access that palette and use it. Um, yes, yeah, so like a surface has got like a palette and it can be indexed in that uh, a hardware hardware texture, like an actual a texture that is on your graphics card kind of palettes. It's not an idea in, in on graphics cards. They don't have the idea of palettes. They've lost that a long time ago. It's not a very uh, modern invention palettes. Um, so they don't have palettes anymore. They just, you know, keep actual, you know, uh, red, green, blue data on, on a hardware thing. So what we're doing here is we're actually like, um, we, we have like a, a palletized tile, which is a four by four pixel um, image uh, that, that, that's palette indexed. And then we set the palette here because uh, the actual, when you actually combine it into a sprite, you actually get to choose what palette to use then. You don't actually choose it on four by four, the, the four by four pixels. You actually choose, I'm, I'm talking about four by four. Uh, it's actually eight by eight pixels. So you got eight by eight pixels um, that has a palette but you don't actually specify what palette to use. Like it's, it's palletized image. So you basically use zero, one, two, three, four. Like you've got like, you go up to 16 colors. So you've got zero, one, two, three, four, up to 16. And then you choose, um, you choose a palette when you combine it into a sprite. So you take these eight by eight pixels and you combine it into like a, a sprite can be whatever size you want. Um, up to like four, four, so it's the maximum image is like four times 16. What's that? Four times sixteen, so it's sixty-four. So you can a sprite on on Mega Drive is up to sixty-four pixels by sixty-four pixels. So when you're combining it up, that's when you actually choose the palette. So when you're combining it up to sixty-four pixels from these little eight pixels things, that's when you choose a palette. So that's what we're doing here. When we combine them up from uh, those eight by eight pixels, we're actually choosing the palette to use when we do it. And that's what we're doing here. We're converting from our, our palletized software idea of a surface. 
and then we combine it into and then we then we kind of like bake it we just say use that use this palette over here to, to like index into this palette over here so that's when we apply the colors and then we convert it into something called a texture which it goes onto your graphics card so if the 8x8 pixels are all software and then we palette like we give it some colors and then we convert it into a texture which goes into hardware so when you actually combine it up into sprites the current sprites that we that we're using is 16 by 16 because they're like level sprites um, and 16 by 16 then goes up to 128, but each one is like a little individual sprite. So sprites at the moment are 16 by 16 and they're made up of four 8 by 8 pixel sprites. So the 8 by 8 ones are software and then when they combine up into 16, we expect that into hardware. So it goes from software to hardware but when you combine up in 16 pixels. So we've got heaps and heaps of different 16 pixels um, images in memory. Uh, in video memory that we can that we can reference. And so when we combine them to 128, 128, we're actually using heaps of different um, we actually, actually the other thing that we do is then we take those 16 by 16 and then make 128 by 128 um, uh, texture and then we bake each of those those 16 by 16 onto that texture. So what's 128 by 16 is, whoops, so eight. So we get eight of them by eight of them. So we just combine those eight up, like eight by eight up and then bake another texture. So when you what you're seeing here when I run, you're actually seeing like, um, you see a couple of um, you see a couple of uh, a couple of layers of, of hardware textures. So when you come down here, where am I? Here we go. When we come down here, when you see 128 pixels by 128 pixels, that's actually a texture. And each one of these 16 was was a texture, but we've kind of baked it into this 128 by 128. We can actually like probably free all of these 16 by 16 ones, but they're still in memory. Well, I don't actually free them, but probably could. I keep them around in memory, but probably could just get rid of them. But then yeah, you've got this 128 by 128 pixel uh, thing in memory as well, uh, in video memory as well. And so when we go to render a level, we're just saying take these 128 by 128 things and just render them, and that's very quick. And you can see like, I mean, it's not a problem, but it is good that we're doing it on, on hardware. We're not actually none, of the, pretty much none of this is in software. Only the 8 by 8 pixels was in software. So the 8 by 8 pixels get colored, rendered into into like um, 16 by 16 uh, hardware textures, and then into 128 by 128. So there's a couple of layers going on, um, but the only things that we do at software level is the 8x8 pixels. Um, palette shifting would mean we would either have to use you know, software or we would have to write a pixel shader basically, or bake in more of these textures. How many colors could you have on the console in total? You could have four palettes and each palette is 16. So you've got 64 colors in total. You could have 16 colors on, uh, 64 colors on screen. Um, not in one sprite though. A sprite can only have one palette, so it can only have 16 colors. So one sprite has 16 colors, um, but on the screen you can have 64 colors. So and it will see. So, so you, with four sprites, you'd have to have use use yeah because you got four palettes. You'd have to use one palette per sprite. So you, over four sprites, you could have um, 64 colors. You have to use four sprites give one pixel, basically each a color, and then render it. Okay, so we've got copy sprite, load tiles. Um, yeah. I'm going to, oh, thank you so much for, for the subscription. Sorry, my uh, I usually have um, a thing come up on my window saying someone just um, subscribed, um, but that's that broke because I upgraded OBS. Um, but anyway, Kaftoot just subscribed to, 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 to uh, using Twitch Prime, so thank you so much. Um, so now I think um, so. One of the things I have to do is understand this sprite mapping f file format um, so that I can actually render Sonic as a sprite. Um, but maybe I can do it another way. So I've got this cells. So I've got these cell surfaces. I'm gonna try and do, um, I'm gonna try and render it by hand, basically. Like come up with a mapping by hand. We'll see, we'll see if it works, I don't know. Um, I actually don't know how big Sonic is. Um, I actually don't know how big Sonic is in um 
in pixels. Just realized looking at you, turn on that GCI doesn't have my GCI comp in. I'm lost there. So when I run GCI, it loads up that file. Is that what you're referencing? Which is just a file that's got, I don't know, I've got some stuff in there. Dot GC, GC, GCI conf. I don't have that. I don't even have a GHC. Oh, I do have a GHC directory. It's got GCI history. So I don't even, like, my GHC directory doesn't even have anything. Yeah, sorry. There might be, um,. Yeah, put it in your home directory, that definitely works. I, 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 there might be another path I can put it in, I don't, I don't know about that. Okay, so I've got, um... Oh, another thing I forgot to show off, actually, is that, um... I've got to show this. Uh, I have... So I've got the Sonic levels being loaded. Actually, I'm going to go back to Emerald Hill Zone because it's more interesting there. So let me go back to Emerald Hill Zone 1. I just looked, uh, sorry, I just noticed this thing when I was going through, the, when I was just reading my main, I just realized I got a feature that I didn't talk about. Oh, weird. I don't, I don't know about that on Arch. That's interesting. Um, okay, so here's Emerald Hill Zone, right? Sorry, I, I updated it to be really massive because this is actually how many pixels um, the Mega Drive saw. Actually, I don't, I don't know if that's accurate. Actually, it's not accurate because... Let me make it a bit smaller while I'm streaming. There we go. So this should be the exact pixels that the Mega Drive had. 320 by 224 pixels. There we go. So this is actually what you saw when you played Sonic. You actually saw this much. No, that's good. Cool. Um, yeah, so one thing I didn't show off yet is if you press C in my app, it actually renders the collision. So that toggles the collision layer. So you can see here, like the art actually matches up to the collision layer. So this is actually what Sonic will collide to. So Sonic doesn't, you know, just collide with the tile. He collides with this collision map that I've, that I've got rendering. So when you're walking through, it's actually interesting because like, you can actually like, um, I don't know, there's kind of like uh, two layers of, of collision as well. I've only got one layer being loaded, but there's kind of, there's, there's a thing where like, this is not uh, collidable from below, but it is from on top. So if you're coming from on top, um, you'll collide from it. But if you're coming from up, like if you're coming from the bottom, if you're going up and you come from the bottom, uh, you won't collide with it. So there's actually like, um, there's actually a, uh, what you call it? Um, like a direction to collision as well. So that's another interesting thing. But that is the collision map. So that's what Sonic will collide with. So when you're running through, you actually collide with all this stuff. And that's that's Sonic's physics. So that doesn't actually, you know, use the actual images. It uses this collision map. And you see here, it's a bit weird because there is like two layers of, um, of collision, which I've only loaded up one layer. So you can only see kind of the layer where you're going through here and then you hit there. So I guess this would be not, you couldn't collide with it from this direction, from the coming from the left, but you could collide with it from the right probably. I, I don't actually know, but I'm guessing that. Um, so you can't collide from it from the left, can't collide from it on the right. So if you're going around here, you know, you could collide with it there, but you, if you're coming through, you probably can't collide from it here. Um, but there's also another layer of collisions. So here, you, there's no, like, there's no collision here, but there's a second layer. So you're probably going up here, probably toggles the second layer. I don't actually know, but I'm guessing that you go up here and it toggles the second layer. And you can do that. And so there's no collision with this thing here either. And so that's that's gonna be another thing that I'm gonna have to have to look into. I'm guessing like this object creates some sort of collision or something, or may either create some sort of special code that Sonic runs on. I don't know. But anyway, that's um 
that's a collision map, so I've got that loaded as well, so that'll be good when I actually get, you know, Sonic being loaded. And now what I'm going to try and do is I have um, Sonic surfaces being loaded. I'm going to try and copy a sprite to the renderer. Whenever we render, I'm going to copy... Uh, so I need a renderer, I need an array. So is this the... Sonic surfaces, maybe? No, that's not it. That's the second argument, so I need to supply something here to say which ones to, to load. Oh, that's the palette, isn't it? I don't have the palette loaded. I'm doing this really dodgy. I just want to see this um, be loaded though. Should be able to render with a palette. Yeah, there we go. Um, and now I need. What do I need? What is that? V. Oh, that's the place to render it. Okay, so, yeah. Actually, that just renders only one, doesn't it? So there's actually more logic from. Yeah, and this is where I need to render as well. Mm. need that logic in here. So what this does is, um, so like I've got copy sprite, but that's probably not even, I guess it's kind of accurate. It's like, so sprite is like, um, an eight by eight. So sprite can be any, any, any size. And so this one is like copying every, um, eight by eight, colorizing it, converting it into a texture, rendering it to this texture that I've created, like this sprite texture, and then rendering four of them. So that's when you've got a block, like when you've got a, so a block in, in, in Sonic is, 16 by 16 pixels, and so it takes the 8 by 8, and then it gets four of them, and combines it together to get 16 by 16. Um, yeah, so I've got this one, so it copies four of them over, and you can see here it's using unsafe indexing, which is really bad, but, but that's how it is at the moment. Um, and what I need to do is kind of generalize that so that you can have, because um, if you read the sprite information, you can have one by two, one by three, two by one, so up to four by four. So here I'm rendering two by two, but I need to be able to generalize this to be able to handle four by four or any, any other size sprite. So I want to kind of have this, this function, but generalized to be able to take any um, number of like up to four by four. I'm not sure what, what that really looks like, but that's what I need to do. Um, but for now I might, no, no, I just want to render something. So uh, I might just leave it like that and Word 16. Oh, that is the actual sprite information. So, what can I do? Right, so that's the actual index. That's the index. Cool. Yeah, that makes sense to me. So, I've got the palette, got the actual data, and then I need the index. So, I'm just going to put zero there for now and see what happens. We'll see what happens. Let's run it. Why not? You just started learning programming, seeing me go through this light speed is amazing. I'm, I'm not even going very fast. <laughs> it's pretty, it's pretty bad, but, but awesome. Thank, thank you. Uh, thanks for the compliment. So here we go. You see up here, I've got an eight by eight. So it's colorized. It's empty. I'm guessing that part of Sonic is empty. Um, so what I'm going to do is like, uh, let's go FF. Actually, I don't want F because I don't want it to specify the palette. So, uh, what is it? So if I got uh, GCI, so O, so let's do binary. I want zero, whoops, 
zero. What's C? C is the pallet line. Oh, C is the pallet. So what's P? P is the priority flag. Okay, well, let's leave that off. So zero, zero for the pallet. Uh, y will be, no, let's not flip the Y. Let's not flip the X. And then we'll go one, one. How many ones do we need? I'm turning each of these A's into a. Actually, I probably shouldn't even do that. So let's go this. Let's go zero, zero for all of these. So then we need, so that's just zero. Okay, so then what we need to do really is specify this. So this will be F. And then we've got up to, how many bits is that? One, two, three, two to the power three is eight. So we've got O, F, whoops. O, F, eight, is that, would that fit that? Would that be the bit mask? I'll show you how to, uh, how to show, I've had to do this over and over again, um, how to show things to bits. Um, it's probably a better way to do it, but I can, you can do show int at base two. Actually, I need char in here as well. So show int to char, uh, int digit, and then I can give it ox f8 empty string. So that's it, but reversed. Whoops. What do I want? Oh, I'm getting confused here. So this is. So it's like that, but zero there. Actually, that's not right either, because it's, it's, it needs to be a word. It needs more, oh, I left off heap of digits, there we go. Okay, so zero, 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 one, 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 and then eight ones. Whoops, uh, I need to do I don't think it's that. I think that's wrong either. That's wrong too. Seven FF. I think that's it. Seven FF. I think that's right. I've seen that before actually. I think. Seven FF. That's exactly right. I should know that. Because I've done it before. Okay, so basically I'm going to need to choose a number between zero and zero FF. That should choose me something that is like that should choose me something that's actually Sonic in Sonic. So I'm just going to choose a number between there and there, um, and we'll just keep. Let's just render a heap of them. So I four is something is a part of. Um, I don't even need I4 though because I'm doing uh I'm doing it from zero. But let's go. Let's get we, we know the first one's bad, so let's just let's go to twenty. And we need to render this at I times eight. What's wrong with that? Int with C int. Oh, okay. Is that it? There we go. So this should render 20 images. Actually not, it should render 19, I think, because we're going one to 20. One second, it just needs to load the level, it takes a second. There we go. Okay, so those are the parts of Sonic. You can actually see those are parts of Sonic being loaded up. That is part of Sonic, so we just need to assemble those in a certain way. I haven't been very successful with um, uh, what do you call it? Haven't been very successful with the um, with alpha stuff in SGL yet. I need to figure out um, like how to make things alpha, how to make them transparent. I haven't really figured that out yet. Um, but anyway, that's what that looks like. I think the first um. I think actually what's interesting is that I think the first color of every palette is meant to be transparent. So I think actually technically you've only got 15 colors 
for every palette. So I think you've actually got, I think I was wrong before when I said you got 64 colors. I think for the first element of every palette represents what color you want to be transparent. So like if you if the first color is like um is like a pink or something, then that means that I want pink in my image in my in my sprites to be transparent. So I think the first color of every palette is actually what you're saying. I want this to be transparent. So when you're actually looking at the, the Mega Drive, even though you've got those palettes in memory, you've got those colors in memory, sorry, um, it's not actually used. So I think you can only get 60 colors. I think that's actually more accurate. Okay, so we've got Sonic being loaded. Um, what we need, really need to do is start working on um, on uh, the sprite mappings. Um, it's gonna be not. It's gonna be a bit tedious and not very fun, but we're gonna have to do it. Um, it's going to be tedious because we're not going to get it right. It's going to take a lot of playing around to try and get it right. Uh, I'm going to load up more than 20 because I can fit a few more on there. There you go, that's, that's, we are loading it up. And now what we need to do is a sprite mapping. A sprite mapping takes these, um, so when I'm trying to generalize it, I've got this, um, like I've got it hard coded right now to say, uh, well, I've got a t block, I've got it hard coded to say, load up zero, put it at that, that, that position, load up. So I'm saying load up these four and put them at these positions. So I've got it all hard coded. Um, what I'll be able to do is I'll be able to, when I, when we have support for sprite mappings, what I'll be able to say is the sprite mapping is um, like cell zero goes to that position. So a sprite mapping is telling, as far as I can tell, is um, taking these eight by eight pixels and then putting them into into a sprite. Sorry, putting them in, telling them what, what position. Oh, thank you. Um, so you know exactly what this is. It is um, Haskell loading up the Sonic ROM and then rendering it. Um, you can see, obviously, it's very, it's very early on. Um, we have, uh, you know, we've got a level being loaded and the, and the actual image is being loaded. Up here, you've got a character being loaded, but it's all, obviously all over the place. Then I've got um, this, which has got no anim animation. So it's like, there's a lot, there's a bit going on, but it's mostly, mostly what I've got so far is compression and rendering uh, blocks. And so I'm trying to generalize a little bit to rendering random sprites, and then we can have a character on the screen. Um, I really want to do palette shifting. I re like, that's really interesting to me. I really want to do palette shifting, but... Um, I think for now I'm going to work on sprites and then I can get rid of these yellow things and I can actually get Sonic on the screen. But yeah, the goal is to make um, Sonic as close to Sonic as possible. So, like, this is pretty much all of Sonic, but also I want to do, like, the physics behind Sonic as well. I want to I want to get as close as I can. I mean, the music is going to be really difficult. I don't know how, how close I'm going to get to the music. Um, I'm going to have to spend a lot, long time on the music, I think. Um, if anyone's really interested in, like, video game music and, like, how they work, Please have a go at the music. I'd, I'd love to see someone um, try and decode the the Sega Mega Drive's music controller thing. It's actually pretty involved, um, and I'm not looking forward to it very much. Um, but I, I do want to try and get as close to Sonic as I can. I do want to get as close to the original. I want to do palette shading. Are you talking about the pixel shader? Um, I want to do palette shifting. Uh, sorry if I said palette shading. Um, I meant shifting. Um, oh yeah, yeah. So. Um, I am talking about the pixel shader. I was thinking about yeah. So I was thinking about doing um, the the uh, doing it through a pixel shader. But my, my hack would also be just to you know render pre-render them to tiles. Um, like so at the moment you know I've got like all these tiles that um, that have a palette built into them. So you know like when you put it onto hardware when you put it onto hardware you have to say what red green blue values you want. Um, and so I'm thinking if I knew ahead of time which I do I, I'm, I'm sure in all of Sonic you don't come up like you know you know what what you're gonna palette shift. So I should be able to bake these images with the sh with the palettes shifted over. So I'll just shift the palette, render a new texture, shift the palette, render a new texture, shift the palette, render a new texture. And so when I go to render, all I'm doing is actually just replacing that tile with a tile that's already been pre-shifted. So I can actually just bake in the palette shifting into the textures, and then and then render that. So that's one way to one way like it'll be the the downside to that is it uses up more RAM on your virtual on your on your video card. But I mean we're talking about 128 pixels by 128 pixel 
Sonic levels. And so on a modern thing, I don't think it's a, it's a problem. Even on a phone, I don't think it's a problem. So like, we could do that. It would be very simple, and I wouldn't. I wouldn't have to deal with shaders. So that's that. Like, I don't know which path to take. I'd kind of like want to play with it with the pixel shader because I mean that would be super fast and would have really no downside other than I have to write a pixel shader, um, and they're not very cross-platform. Is my understanding. So I kind of conflicted on should I just do the simple thing and bake in all the textures? I think that would work really well. It would be fast. I don't really see a downside to that other than it uses up more memory. Or I could go pixel shader and actually write the code to, to do it. But then I'm actually dealing with less Haskell. I guess that's the downside. Um, if I write a pixel shader, I'm actually not using Haskell. I'm using the pixel shader language, which I forgot the name of. Do you have a roomy of the goal of the projects? No. Um, no, I haven't written up the goals. I should write up the goals somewhere. Um, I mean, really, the goal is just Sonic in Haskell as close as we can to, to Sonic. Um, the original Sonic 2, um, the actual, you know, the ROM, um, but um, with abstraction. That's kind of like the other goal. So I've kind of got two goals. It's like I haven't got there yet because this isn't hardly abstracted at all. But but the set, like when I when I when I get this close to running Sonic 2, I want to try and abstract it so you can actually run your own GSLSL. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Commit. Thanks for thanks for still watching. Thanks for being around and thanks for the host. This is awesome. Uh, let's write a Haskell library to write pixel shaders. I'm sure Commit's already done that. <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, I want to. I want to. My, my second goal is abstraction. So like, if you want to, like, so we'll we'll write the rules of Sonic. And if you don't like the way that gravity works in Sonic or something, you can change gravity. That's what I want to. That's what I want to do. Oh, you already beat you to it. Okay, cool. So there's a GL, GLSL library for writing. Uh, sorry, there's a Haskell library for writing GLSL. So we could actually probably just write more Haskell to write pixel shaders. I'm conflicted. Anyway, that's that's something that I want to do in the future. I just kind of want to focus on, on getting sprites to render accurate, accurately right now. Um, but yeah, in the future, I would like to get abstraction um, so that if you don't like how gravity works or you don't like a certain part of Sonic, you can actually compile your own Sonic. That's that's kind of like a secondary goal I have. I think that like I think that will demonstrate. Um, that you can write performant games um, accurately. Like you can actually write like low level kind of. I mean, like Sonic is is what you would probably think of as like a low level game um, because it's you know a Mega Drive game. Um, so I want to show that it's possible to write low level things, but also add ab add abstraction in so you can modify things. That's kind of like that's kind of like a second like that's kind of like a point I want to try and push as well. But I mean, that's like that's going into my, my like my theory behind behind functional programming and that. But like I think we can do low level programming but also have abstraction and also, you know, do things accurately to a mega drive. But that's I mean, that's kind of like that is kind of like a goal behind it, but I don't, I don't really care really like the ideal thing that I want right now is just an accurate Sonic 2. Um why didn't I do that instead of an emulator? Because I want to try and push this abstraction. So that, I think that kind of explains why I don't want to do an emulator because I want to try and show that we can try and make things as close to possible as like original Mega Drive games, but also add abstraction in so that we can modify the game logic to whatever we want. Um, yeah, because I mean, you can see this, like if you look if you look very quickly, like when I was looking up this, um, there's many, many different um, uh, ROM hacks that people make. Um, people make heaps and heaps of different ROM Macs, and the way that they do it, I mean, it's probably it's definitely probably fun to them. But the way that they do it is they go in there, like they want to play Sonic 2, but they want it to be a bit different. So they go in there and they modify the assembly to to achieve what they want. And that, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure they love doing it. But um, for people that want to have their own Sonic game but don't want to modify that, you know, don't want to have to learn Motorola 68000 assembly to be able to learn to to modify to make the game that they want or to to fix a bug in Sonic that has annoyed them or something like that. I don't want them to have to do that. I would like to have abstractions so that they can modify code and they can compose together their own Sonic game. That that's kind of like something else I'm trying to push, but but anyway. So that's why I'm not not really working on an emulator. I want to do Sonic just to show that we can we can take a game and then modify it in some way. To make it better if we want to but anyway for now for now the initial goal is just to make a sonic that actually that actually works that's actually something similar as close to possible as the original thanks for that link i'll um i'll have a look at that i, I don't think i've watched that one so I'll, I'll have a look at that one okay so we've got sprite mappings that we want to load up sprite mappings Let's get a start on this. We haven't we haven't written a huge amount of code today. We've both mostly been shifting stuff around, which has been a little bit annoying. So let's let's write a little bit of code. Probably won't be good code, but we'll write it. You can 
probably get you through running. It would be an eight line shader, that's for sure. It would be. Yeah, you're right. Completely right. That it would definitely be just an eight line shader. Uh, so we're gonna take in maybe byte string, I guess. So this is how I usually start doing things. I usually just add the imports and I just stub out the API that I start wanting. So I know that I'm going to have... Uh, let me just do that. And I'm going to take in a byte string. I know that. And the byte string is going to be looking like this. And so I don't think this is compressed. Um, I didn't see it, but I don't think it's compressed. So if we go to the S2 disassemble mappings, we go to sprite. So here's the sonic mappings. And so, um, I don't think this is compressed. It doesn't look like it's compressed to me. It looks like it's just, that's how it is. Um, consists of four words. Uh, what is a word here? Word length number, high byte, low byte. So I guess a word is two bytes. High byte, low byte. Okay, so that's a word, okay. High byte, low byte, so, so it takes four words. Four words are the following purposes. So uh, a byte string is a array of word eight. So if we unpack it, we've got an array of word eight. And then we want to get, well, it says four, it takes four words four words of word 16. So, sorry, word is word 16 here from what I can tell because it says high byte, low byte. So I'm guessing it's, what it means is it's two bytes, two bytes per word, which is fine. That's a, that's a word 16. So if we unpack that, we'll get that and it's four words. So it's actually, we're gonna actually do eight. So we're gonna say chunks of eight because we're gonna deal with word eights. So that'll give us, um, so each one of these is going to be a sprite mapping. So then we're going to do something with that mapping. So this is going to be a list of word eight, and the size of is going to be it's going to be eight of them. And then we'll do something with that. So we'll have to index into each one of those and do something. And so really chunks of like it would be better if we had a chunks of eight, and that would actually size this thing. So it would actually be like a like a thing that actually said, hey, I actually have eight word eights, but this thing we're using list, so it kind of sucks, but we'll deal with that. We'll probably do something dodgy, but we'll deal with it. So the high byte is the relative top side edge position, so I don't care about that. So I'm gonna uh, pull this slow mapping, I guess. It's gonna take a list of word eight. So I don't know what we're going to return. Like we're going to make a probably like a, a data type called like mapping or something. So I'm going to just use unit for now as, a, as to stub that out. Uh, but we need word eight imported. We need chunks imported. Okay. And so we need to. So the high byte we're going to ignore. High byte we're going to ignore, low byte is the size of the sprite in tiles minus one, so that's the size, okay. So that's the size. Oh, you think it's for OpenCL, not GLSL? I think Kernel had something that called Shady or something, okay. Shady Gen, functional CPU programming, that sounds like it could be it. Kernel? Yep, yeah, there we go. Okay. GLSL, cool. I'll have a look. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I've never done um, STL and uh, GL, like and shaders before, so I don't know. I'll, I'll have a look. I'll see if that's like a feasible thing. 
I mean, I'm, I'm sure I know you can do. I know you can do SDL and, and shaders, but I just don't know how easy it is and how cross-platform. Um, Kamet, you probably know more about it, but um, probably easy to load the shader like I do in Quine. I don't know about that. Okay, I've I've, I have looked at Quine before, but I, I don't remember it very well. Easy to load the shader like I do in Quine. Okay. Um, STL, I can probably just give it the A line shader and just be done. I could probably just do that. Oh, okay, GLSL is is pretty cross platform. Cool. Okay. Oh, I wasn't confident. I, I I think I remember reading a while ago that GLSL is is not very cross platform, but it might might have changed. I know things have changed a lot actually in, in shaders before when I was from when I was looking at it. Second applies to one player mode. Third applies to two player. Okay, second word. So these are actually uh, the ones that we want, and then the third is the ones that we don't. And then what's the fourth word? Left side. So we don't want that one, one either. Okay. So we want this, and we don't want this. Okay, that's a super ugly pattern, but we've written it. Really ugly pattern, but we, we've done it. Um, there will be a better way to do this, but anyway. You can do GLSL 3.3 on basically, on everything on the web planet, basically. Awesome, cool, okay. Cool. We can we can do the palette shape, the pixel shader thing, which would be pretty cool. It would be pretty cool to actually do, you know, a pixel shader um, palette shift. It'd be cool. Rather than my workaround, which is probably fine as well. But it's bleeding edge stuff that is harder to use. Oh, okay. So OpenGL four point one is the ceiling. Oh, okay. Interesting. Okay. Well. You know, we're doing Sonic the Hedgehog, so we don't, that's, that's, okay, cool. As long as we've got like a base level that we can do Sonic the Hedgehog with, I'm happy. So we don't need this fourth word, we don't need the third word, we do need this, this second word, because the second word is one player mode, but it is the palette, this um, palette index thing. So I kind of have like, I really should write a, a new type for palette index. Because that's a palette index. But anyway, uh, low bytes are the size of the tile. Upper four bits are ignored. Next two bits control. So the upper four bits are ignored. So we actually need to ignore the, four, the upper four bits. The next two bits control the width, and the lowest two bits control the height. Okay, so uh, what's that mean? So the oops, uh, not overlay strings. Literal, um, binary literals. There we go. So we're using using this. So what I'm reading is that it says right. You need to, the lowest two bits. The lowest two bits are these, right? The lowest two bits are one one, which is three. So a mask is three, and that will be the, the lowest two bits are the height, right? So the height. So I'm going to say let height equals s and three, right? So that should give me the height. So I need to import this. So this is how I'm translating it, right? So I'm seeing low, lowest two bits. So I'll go over here and I'll figure out what that means. Okay, three. Okay, so the bit mask is three. And then I want width, and it says the width is so the that's the the ones to the left of that. So I should say zero zero. So ignore the width and give me the sorry, ignore the height, give me the width. So that's twelve, uh, which. Which is C. So our mask is C. So that'll be the width. Width is the is C. We get out the C from the uh, from our from our low byte. And the height is three, so we get out the three. So then that will tell us okay, and it also says in tiles minus one. Minus one. So this is it's actually plus one is how we'd go. Um, so it's that plus one is what is the actual width. I don't know what we're going to need, but we're either going to need it to be accurate or, or plus one. 
Okay, so we've got the width and the height. That's cool, so we've got that. And then this is actually the palette index. So that's really straightforward as well. Um, the palette index was the thing that we were looking at before, where it, um, these A's represent the actual index into the tile, and this is the X and the Y to flip. And so I think I've got here somewhere, copy sprite, yeah, here we go. So when I got copy sprite, you actually give it a word 16. So I'm actually going to combine these two word eights into a word 16. I've written that somewhere before already, word 16s. Here we go. So I should, I really need to put this into like a, I don't know if Komet can tell me if there's, this should exist somewhere, right? This word eight, word eight, word 16. That should exist somewhere. I've not seen it really anywhere. I've, I've written it a couple of times. I've got a library that's got it. Um, but I feel like that should be somewhere accessible, like somewhere in base or somewhere, I don't know. I feel like it should be somewhere, I don't really see it. I've written a library that's got it, but I haven't seen it. It's not packaged in base or anything like that, okay. Do you do you have a trick to, to do that easily? Because I do things like that. And I'm just gonna copy and paste it here again. I need to put it into a library, I know, but that's what, that's what it's gonna look for now. Uh, I do actually have a library that has it, but I don't really like the library very much. Okay, that's what you do, cool, okay. Alright, I feel like it should exist somewhere, but okay. I had a, I wrote a, a library, and I'm not, I, I'm conflicted on it, um. I wrote a library a while ago, I think I was actually like, working on this stuff, and then I stopped and, and, and wrote a library, um. Where is it? I wrote it, it must have been a while ago. Yeah, it must have really been a while ago. What did I call it? If only I was good with names, I'd probably remember. Halves, here we go, halves. You got a library called Bytes, that would be a plausible home for it. So I wrote, okay. It's a mismatch, okay. So I wrote something called halves, and I'm, I'm conflicted on it. Um, so it's a class, and it represents an isomorphism between a type, and it's being split in half. Um, so, you know, the obvious instances are word 16, word 8, um, you know, word, word 64 and word 32. So it's kind of like splitting in half and because it's an isomorphism, you can go backwards and forwards. So, um, you know, you can split something in half or you can combine it up from a half, from halves. Um, and you can go, you can go further and go quarters and eights and stuff. And so I wrote this little library and I was using it, but I, I'm kind of conflicted on it. I don't really like, um, the way I wrote it was that I've got two function dependencies. So like the, the, um, like the word, like the, the actual, uh, the thing that you're splitting up determines what it splits into and what it splits into determines, uh, you know, what it combines into. And the reason for that was for type inference. I wanted a good type inference. And so I can take, you know, word eight and I know that I'm going to get back a word 16 because I'm going to combine them together. And I kind of, I'm conflicted, I'm conflicted on this library because I don't really like, like these function dependencies, but, um, I do like the result. It gives me good type inference. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you, um, if you've got any comments, comment, that'll be great, but, um, I, I am conflicted on it. I don't know if I should use it very much or not. Um, at the moment I've been quite, kind of avoiding it and just been doing stuff like this, but I mean, really this would just be from halves, I think. It'd be like X, Y from halves. Something like that, which I think looks pretty good and it makes sense to me. But anyway, I'll keep going with this. A couple of type families will give you the same kind of result, but a function dependency probably less noisy to use. Okay. So, you have no preference either way. Do you, do you, I mean, what do you think about the halves type class? If you if you look at this halves type class, would you use it or would you think, uh, I'll just I'll just do this? I mean, that, that's kind of how I feel about it. It's like, yeah, it's okay, but I'll kind of just do that. Okay. Okay. If, as long as you're not saying it's awful, that gives me a little bit of confidence. A 
I'll ignore it for now, but I will probably go back through the code and, and, and fix that up then. Um, what, what is this? This is the, what do they call it? The palette index, palette index, right? They do call it the palette index. Yeah, it's the palette index. Sega Genesis VDP palette indices. Only benefit that Thai families would be that you gave you a way to make data foo equals foo half a without making foo to take two type parameters. Foo a, foo half a. Oh, okay. Okay. Interesting. I'll think about that. That's, that's actually interesting, isn't it? Half a. Hmm, right, because you got to, yeah, okay. I don't know if that's useful or not. It might be. I'll think about that. That's that's good, thank you. Right, but it, if I'm if I'm writing a functional dependency, okay, so um, I guess the question is, if I'm using functional dependencies to implement it, um, it makes it easy for me to implement. But if I go through to um, if I go through to using type families, would that mean that it would only be an implementation concern for me to like, would it, on a usage side it would not change, right? It would only be harder for the impl implementer or the people that are making instances, because I don't really care about that. If it, if it's just people writing instances, I don't really care if it's if it's a bit trickier. If I get these benefits, like you're like you're mentioning, if I get those benefits, I'll go that direction and get rid of the functional dependencies. Um, as long as there's like no d downgrade to like people actually using it, which sounds like there probably isn't. Looking at it, it sounds like there's no downside to using type families for people that go to use this library. I mean, I guess other than like people, like if, if you're actually going to use these light lenses and actually use them, it, make, it makes no difference. But if you're going to write instances, it, it's it's a bit trickier. Is that is that accurate? Painful each wrench bunch of doubled halved A is A type of subclass constraints and like yeah okay and that is painful. Okay. That is painful. Hmm. And so if someone went to make an instance they'd have to do the same thing, right? So this is if the sprite should be flipped. That's what's kind of, that's what's confusing me here. So this is if the sprite should be lit, should be flipped. Um, I think it actually. I don't know if it's accurate. If this, that the sprite should be flipped horizontally and vertically, respectively, and the A is the actual tile index. I feel like when they said sprite, they, they actually meant tile here. I think when they're saying sprite, they don't mean the whole sprite should be flipped. Because that's what's confusing me. I'm thinking, how do you flip the whole sprite? But I think what it's actually trying to say. So it's actually the tile index. Oh no, because, oh, I see what's happening, right. So a sprite mapping must say, take, it's the size of the sprite and tiles minus one. So when it's actually saying index into 20, I think they must be, um, Hmm. 
What is it saying? Yeah, it must be saying that um, it starts at 20. So it starts at hex 20. VRAM must have had divided by 20. Right, I'll divide by 20. Okay, so it's actually saying, I think what it's saying that's actually the start offset. So I think actually when it says flip horizontally and vertically, it's actually, um, it actually is saying it flips. So the reason for the flips exists so you can make symmetric sprites take up less space. Um, yeah, that would be it, yeah. So you can flip, flip so you got Sonic and it's pointing one direction, you flip, you flip Sonic around and he faces the other direction, yeah. Um, I guess that's it. But you should be able to, when you go to render a sprite, I think that's when you get to say when you want to flip it. So that's, I mean, that's kind of confusing to me because it's like, why is the sprite saying that should be flipped horizontally and vertically? When you go to render it, you should be saying whether you want to flip it vertically or horizontally, I think. Maybe not. Maybe not. Because when I load up things into chunks and that, I'm not saying whether, like I'm saying whether ind each individual part gets flipped. So maybe that's what it's saying. Um, I mean, what I'm, what I'm going to guess, right, here, here's, here's, uh, this is a little bit confusing to me, but here's what I'm guessing. Low byte is the size of the sprite, so what it says is take this many, um, like the, the ending, the offset of the last sprite is um, the starting index here, so this is like the starting index, and so the size is, um, the size in total, like I mean it's got the, you know, the width and the, and the height, you can figure that out, but um, the size is how many sprites take in. Actually, that can't be right either, can it? Because if I've got... Because you've got... Um, you've got that. you got that, so you've got 15. Which is 4 by 4. But if you're saying you want... Um, you want it to be... Let's say we want it to be two, two high and four. Actually, that's not too high. That's this is too high. So it's two pixels. No, this is width. I'm getting confused here. So this is width. That's height. So we're saying two, two, uh, two tiles high. Sorry, two tiles wide and four tiles high. That's what that, that reads as. So two high, uh, two, two wide, four high. Two wide, four high. Okay. Um, and so that says seven. Now, if I went the other direction, if I said I want it to be four tiles high, but um, two tiles, sorry, four tiles wide, but two tiles high, then it says 13. And so I'm trying to think of like, maybe this is like an offset. Maybe the size represents an offset to, to get the tiles, but I don't think that is accurate. Uh, like I thought maybe it was just, you know, you get this, you get this, uh, you get this index here, the A's, and then you add the size, but I don't think you can do that because you can see it's different. You can see that, you know, even though we're still only getting um, two by four, so we're still only getting um, eight sprites, like eight tiles in. You got different size. So zero zero here means one, yeah, is one. So zero to four, not zero to three. Runs one to four, not zero to three. Yeah, that's right. That's yeah, that's right. Yeah. So this is when we see here, we're at, that's actually two, and when we see here, that's actually four, because you can't have a sprite of size zero. It doesn't make sense. So they've, they've left that off. So this is a sprite of width four, and high one. And you multiply it by eight to actually get the actual pixels, but yeah, that's how that's how it is. So it's a it's eight by eight, it's four eight by eight pixels by one eight by eight pixel. You can buy that together. And you get that. Um, so I don't think it is actually an offset. So there must be something else. Um, I'm not sure what. Like I'm not like it's got a tile index. A sprite is made up of this many tiles, and then we've got a one index. So I'm just trying to figure out. What does it mean, like if I've got, if I've got, if the size is, um, you know, four by four, I know that I have to get like, you know, 16 um, tiles out from this index. I know that I need to get 16 out, but I'm just trying to figure out what order is it in. Um, and if I've got one by, you know, if I've got one by three sprites, do I just start reading in three? Like uh, what, what order do I, do I read it in? And like if I go one, two, three, then I guess it's like the top sprite, the middle sprite, and then the bottom sprite. If I've got two by three, then what is it? Is it like, does it, is it go, go by horizontal? I'm guessing it probably goes horizontal. So I'm guessing I need to actually read these in, multiply them together. So I think it's actually like, 
um, the tile, like this pattern index that I've got here. So that's the pattern, pattern index, and I need to get our tile index from that. Which we said was 07FF, right? I think we said that. Was it int to digit? be four of those, another four, and then three. Yeah, that's exactly it. Okay, so that is the tile index. That's the tile index, cool. Okay, so, so that, that's the tile index. So now what do we get? Like, I guess it's the tile index plus width times height will be the ending. So we take all of those. We say tile index until that, whoops. And we need to load them out from that uh, from our tile temp tile memory. I mean that's 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 what I'm that's what I'm understanding from this. My tile memory looks like this. I should really clean these up with type aliases and that, but this is what we got. So I think we want to, uh, I mean, what are we loading up when we load up a mapping? Um, it is basically this code, it is basically, basically this copy sprite, isn't it? It's very similar to this. It's basically this, it is basically this. Um, yeah, we just need to create a texture first, that's the only difference I guess. So here, what we're doing is we're taking in a word 16 um, and we're getting out the, uh, see here, we're getting out the one tile. What we want to do this is instead of taking out just one tile, we want to go through each one based on the width that we pass in. Generate that. So this takes a pattern. Yeah, so it's basically, it is basically that, isn't it? So we don't actually need to, need to know about that. Yeah, I think that'll actually work, okay. We do need that, it's a pattern index. We need to pass in the pattern index to this copy sprite function. Let's just let's just work, focus on getting one out then. Uh, so copy sprite takes a renderer, we don't have a renderer passed in. This is actually more general. This is instead of a mapping. This is actually really loading up. Um, what I'll do is I'll here we go. So a mapping a sprite mapping is a sprite mapping, and it contains width, height. The word eights at the moment. They really should be word twos, but the word eights. Um, word eights. It should be word twos, um, and then a word sixteen for the pattern index. And really, those should each have another have a, have a type as well. But anyway, so then we'll get a sprite mapping width, height, pattern index. So now we've loaded up this. That should work right. So we separate it. We'll, we'll separate the loading from the uh, from the actual rendering. So there we go. We've got the loading. So this will load up the sprite mappings. And over here, what we'll do is we'll change this to take a sprite mapping, and that'll make it a little, a little bit nicer. Well, 
like that a little better. Okay, so instead of word 16, so we've got copy sprite, that should be copy sprite tile, I'm gonna call that. And then we'll, we actually will write a copy sprite. Which will basically be the same, instead of this word 16 though, it'll take in a list of sprite mappings, is that right? Sprite mapping? I think over here we have blocks which do basically that. There we go. So we've got load block. I'm gonna replace that. No, it's not gonna take in a list, it's gonna copy in, it's gonna render sprite. So it's gonna be render sprite mapping. Cool. And this will be I don't know what that will be. What will that be? What is our load block doing? So load blocks goes through and renders a load block for every what's that cells and C. So for every C, okay, so it goes through the four of them and renders them. Yeah, okay. So really if we change that to a sprite mapping, we could say go through each one. Yeah, so we want that to be a sprite mapping. So load block, we got a sprite mapping, yeah, so copy sprite mapping, cool. So that will do basically what we have here. With height and what's the mapping got inside of it? It's got the Yeah, it's got the palette index. Uh, is the palette index? No, it's the, what do we call it? Pattern, pattern index. It's a bit confusing between palette index and pattern index. We've got pa pattern index. Uh, game, Sega, Sonic, and Sprite mappings. See, this is partial code as well. It's, all of this is really dodgy. We'll have to fix it up. Just got a sprite mapping. Oh, whoops! I replaced the wrong thing. Uh, what was that? I call that cells, but it's tiles. Okay, so we've got our width, height, pattern index. So I should be able to say. Hopefully we'll have some code working in one second. Hopefully it'll only take a couple of seconds for me to get this working. Copy sprite tile. Uh, we'll actually copy it from the pattern index. Pattern index. Okay, cool. So what I'm gonna do is say for um, That we're, maybe I should take the minus one off. I think I should take the one off. Okay. So it's width minus one. Uh, so that'd be x. Actually, I think I need to do it this way. Because I'm indexing it, I think it'll go across using the x first. Y times eight, and that'll be pattern index plus Y will be, oh, we'll, what will that be? A 
bx what will that be x plus y no it's not x plus y yeah that's where I'm getting confused I guess that's where I'm getting confused let's just run a pattern index for now and we'll, we'll figure out what, what the layout looks like in a second What's this missing? It doesn't like my pattern index. That's no, that's not right. Render a palette tiles. Render a palette tiles. That's right. Once a word eight. Oh, oh, I see. I need to from it. Okay. Sorry, I thought I was passing arguments in the wrong order or something there. Okay. Hang on. So what's this? One. Oh, okay. This might help out a little bit actually. So what we had was this. I figured this out by just trying it out. And so what it was is zero, so it goes across. So it goes across and then it goes down. So index two is height one, x zero, yeah, okay. So how would I, how, would I, how do I combine the width and the height to get that? Um, so I forgot, so two, Shift it by which one? Yeah, I think I'll just shift it, right? I'll just shift. Which one do I want to shift? X. Oh, bits. Looking forward to Simon Payton Jones' debut. Awesome. That would be great. <laughs> That's not right either. So it's not shifting. It's um. What do I want to do here? I want to. If I've got x of zero, y of two, y of one. Oh, I've confused myself. I want to combine these into an index. How do I combine these two into an index? Oh, it's uh. Times width, isn't it? Right. So it would be like y. Something like that, except I think I flipped it around. So, why is two in there twice though? That's not quite right. Zero, one, two, and then two, because it's zero. Oh, okay, because it's the same one. Um, it's not that, is it? One, two, three. Yeah, that is that. Okay, that's what. I, okay, okay. Now I'm missing parentheses. Well, I'm really struggling today. There we go. That's right. Oh, but I need to do it from integral again. Okay, so I think I've calculated the index properly. That took me a while to figure it out. Sorry about that. But I think I've got the index. What's the problem here? from integral height. Okay, that's something, I don't know. Actually, I might be able to get rid of these ones because I think that was a word eight, wasn't it? 
Whoops. No, it doesn't like that. Why is the pattern index and why? Oh, pattern index is 16. I see. Okay, okay. Okay, we're there. That'll do. So let me export that copy sprite mapping. We've got copy sprite tile, copy sprite mapping. Okay, cool. Okay, so hopefully now we can take a... Um, I have to update main, I think. Blocks. I need to update blocks as well. Blocks, blocks has got some code duplication now because I've generalized this. But anyway, uh, we'll copy sprite tile. So I need to fix up the code duplication. Um, and I need to update main. So now instead of doing copy sprite, I'm actually going to load up the mappings. So I'm going to load up. Uh, Sprite mappings, or was it? Or was load load sprite mappings, and that is S two disassembly art. No, it's not. It's mappings. I think Sonic bin maybe. No, Sonic sprite. Sonic bin. There we go. Sprite Sonic bin. So this will be the Sonic mappings. So now I will render the first one. render I only want to do that once when we load up so copy the mapping and I need to pass in a renderer and then what was it the palette is that the second thing yeah palette and then pound an array of the surfaces how do I get the surfaces sonic surfaces There we go, so that will give me a sonic texture. And then I will want to copy it. Uh, and what do you do when you copy? You have to give it size you want to copy from and then the size you want to copy to. Ah, oh, okay, so that's something else I'm going to have to do. We're going to have to give it the size of the texture because we don't know. We don't know what the size is. Um, that's something else we're going to have to store with the te with the with that texture. Um, but for now, we'll just say it's a uh, 16 by 16. I don't know. I don't actually don't know how how big it is. So let's render it to. Uh, This is the position, and this is the size. So we'll say 16. I don't, uh, yeah, we don't know how big the thing will be. We don't know how big Sonic is going to be. So there we go. Hopefully now we can run it. It compiles, so it should work. It doesn't actually qualify when I'm writing Sonic. Okay, now hopefully we've got something. I don't. I, I'm not sure. Hopefully we've got something. Come on. Well, it's it's just black. Okay, <laughs> that didn't work. Let me make sure that everything is still working. Otherwise, so I'm commenting out my uh, my dodgy render on top. No, 
I broke everything else. How did I break everything? Everything's broken. Why is everything broken? So I'm just commenting out the stuff I added to main, but I don't think that's going to be the problem. It's going to be something that I changed somewhere else. I wonder what I did. I didn't do much. I added code. I didn't really modify the existing code. That was kind of like a to-do to, to go back and refactor it. Okay, so it was the main I added. What have I done? What have I done here that means that nothing else works? I can't even load up. Oh, I see. You have to set the target. It's really bad. SGL's got this like mutable render thing. It's really, really, really awful. Absolutely awful. And so here we'll have to say render to nothing. So then we'll start rendering back to the window. Um, yeah, yeah, it's got this mutable renderer thing. And so what was happening was that it was everything was rendering to the Sonic sprite. That was, yeah. It was rendering to the Sonic sprite. All the level was being rendered to one little tiny sprite that didn't actually get rendered to the screen. So that, that was the problem there. Okay. Thanks, mutability. Loading chunks, there we go. Okay, so that's something up there. <laughs> it is something. I don't know what it is, but it's something. Um, I don't think our sprite mapping's working. <laughs> it is doing something, but it doesn't look right. Um, but one thing I'm going to do is... Uh, I'm going to trace. This is a good thing in Haskell if you don't if you haven't done much Haskell, uh, trace is really useful if you're doing things like this. Um, you import debug.trace and it gives you this function. So trace shows. Now every time that this gets called, every time like we actually evaluate this, I mean laziness makes it a little bit interesting. Like it doesn't like when this actually gets evaluated, when this is actually needed, we'll get a trace statement out. What's wrong here? Oh, that's not word 8, that's a word 16. I'll probably add the type up here, but anyway. So now I should see the sprite mapping as it gets evaluated. So it should show me one sprite mapping. It shouldn't show me every sprite mapping, it should only show me the first one. Yeah, there we go. So size, is, width is 12. Okay, well that's obviously completely wrong. I really screwed up there. <laughs> that is completely wrong. Um, How did I get, how did I get that? Oh, I see. Um, I'm ending it with C. I don't want C. I want C take three. What's C take three? That's why I want nine. I think I want nine. Let's do our thing where we import everything to show int at base two. 9 should be rendered as... No, I don't want 9. I don't want 9. That's not what I wanted. Because OXC, you can see... No, that is OX. I do want that. That is what I want. But I want it shifted. Ah, oh, I want it shifted. That's what... Okay. I want it shifted. That's what I want. I forgot to shift it. I forgot to shift it at the end. All right. So OXC, and then we want to shift R2. So I'll shift it over two bytes. Sorry, this bit logic is, it's not something I'm very good at. I make mistakes all the time. I think everyone does though. I don't think, I don't think anyone is like highly skilled at this. Maybe, maybe there are people out there, maybe people are really good at it, but... Okay, so it says 3 by 0, which means 4 by 1. 4 by 1. Okay, so one's 4 by 1, and... My sprites... What's happening? So my sprites here. So we'll go zero. So the height is 
zero. So it'll be zero dot zero. So actually, I think that's okay. So 430 is the index that we're using. Um, it's the tile index that we're using. I think we must be must be getting this wrong. Try that. This will uh, show us the, the new, uh, what do you call it, the, the pattern index that we're going to use, the new pattern index. So it goes 430, 431, 432, 433. Okay, and it's 4 by 4. Okay, so that's, I mean, that's fine. Um, because the height is, the height is one one uh, it's eight by eight so it's like eight pixels high and it should be four pixels wide I mean four like four tiles wide So I think our main problem out here, like our main, is that we're rendering it um, 16 by 16 pixels, but it's actually uh, what's it, 4 by 4 by 8. So 32 pixels wide by 8 pixels tall. That's really what it should be. That doesn't seem right though. Like, why would Sonic be that many pixels? I think that's completely wrong. I think we're we're off. Because of Sonic, like, there's no sprite in Sonic that should be, like, there's not, like, we're loading up Sonic sprites, that's, it's meant to be Sonic sprite mappings, and so why would he be, um, four tiles wide? I mean, that, that's even, that's not quite right either, because that's, that's, that doesn't look right anymore. It actually looked more correct before, it actually looked more correct as 16. Let's make it really big, so 64. It actually looked more right like this, which I don't get. Like that's that's more right. Like that's that's more like it's not stretched. Like I mean, it's scaled, but it's not stretched. Before it was stretching it, so our texture actually is coming out weird. I wonder if oh, it's because our texture size. We haven't taken into consideration the texture size. That's that's the problem. Okay. So when we go to create a texture here, so notice how we're creating it 16 pixels by 16 pixels. That's wrong. That's wrong. There we go. So it needs to be uh, eight. Times width plus one and eight times height plus one. There we go. And now I'm going to do from integral. Okay, maybe it might make sense to go back and put plus one on the width. I don't know. Now I'm, I'm, I'm getting conflicted between that now because sometimes we have to like make a range using it and sometimes not. So it's probably better to put plus one, I guess. All right, that's something. That is something. Uh, so now let's go back to where we had it before, which was how many pixels wide we had it? 60, uh, 32, 32 by uh, eight. But let's double both of those because we want it a bit bigger. We'll just see it, see it a bit bigger. So let's go 128, and then 8 times 4 is 32. So I think I just multiply that by 4. I should have. Uh, so it should be, should be able to see it pretty big on the screen now. It's something. It's definitely not right, but it's, it's loading up a set of sprites. It is loading them up.
Hmm. going to traverse the sprite mappings. So I'm going to create a sprite mapping, uh, sorry, a texture for every uh, mapping that we found. I just want to see if the mappings are right or not. Uh, I have a feeling that they're not. So now I'm going to go through every um, Sonic texture. I mean, the thing is, it's going to be, the size depends on the texture, so it kind of, it's not very good here. Uh, I'm going to do 8 times i. Okay. So this should render, I don't know, some sprites. I just think they're wrong. I think the mapping, my mapping code is wrong. Try this. Um, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna finish it out here anyway. Um, I'll give this a go. We'll see what happens. Let me know if you've got any questions about what I've been working on. Um, anything you'd like to see? Okay. I see patterns, but I'm not sure if that's just rain, if that's just accidental or not. Like, I think it might just be accidental. Um, hmm. And what's confusing to me is that we're loading up Sonic Sprite mappings things, but we've got like 3x3, three three, so that's 4x4, four four. that's actually by 4x4, four, four four. Um, uh, tiles, and then 0, and then 2 tiles, 1, like, 1 tile, like, if it's Sonic Sprite mappings, why do we have random, um, why do we have random random sizes constantly? Like you think Sonic would be one size, like it wouldn't keep changing like that. So I think I think our sprite mappings is wrong. It's gotta be wrong in, in some way. I'm not sure why. I mean we we did read this. Uh four words of the first word, second word, third word. Maybe 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 we're reading it backwards. When it says four words, maybe this is actually reversed. I'm gonna quickly try that. I, I don't know if that'll fix things, but I'm gonna quickly try that. I'm just gonna flip it. I don't know if that's gonna fix anything at all, but we'll try it. Um, otherwise, I don't think it's compressed, but I could look at that and see if it's compressed. Let's, let me look really quickly. Um, is that better? Three by three, one by one, three by something, three by three, three by three. They're actually more, it's a lot more consistent. It is a lot more consistent. That is interesting. Maybe I was just doing it reverse. Um, yeah, interesting. Okay, so let me, um,
just gonna go 32 here, and we'll try it. We'll try again. See what this looks like. Um, I don't know. It's getting things like I mean, that's something. I think that's actually something. That's not. It might just be random that that kind of looks like something. It might not actually. I don't know. I mean, it does. It does actually look like his head, though. I don't know. It does look like his head. Um, yeah, uh, let me let me look really quickly. I'll just go on. So let's look at the mappings files. Uh, here you go, that's the mapping. Map unk Sonic. I'm just going to see if there's any decompression around here. No, make art tile. That's a macro. Yeah, that's a macro. Uh, great. So yeah, I think it's not compressed. I can't see any compressed information here. I think what I would expect is that um, as soon as it loads up the mappings it would decompress, but it doesn't seem to do that. Yeah, it doesn't seem to do that. It just does this make art tile thing, thing uh, which does that. Convert from tile index to art tiles block mapping mappings of VRAM address. Uh, art tile. Where is that defined? I'm not very good at my assembly, so. Yeah. I try. Um, so, I don't know, there's someone in there that does the actual logic behind doing the art tile, I guess. Um, I can't find it. I don't think it's a macro art tile. No. It's not a function, is it? No. Because there's actually something defined in here somewhere. I just don't know where. So I'm guessing art tile is like a function or something. Um, it's art tile A1. Yeah. It's like an index though. I don't know. Yeah, that's an index, isn't it? Let's calculate the index. Art tile index a zero. So it is making the art tile from that mapping. I don't know. I've got to. I guess I've got to figure that out. Okay. Um, I'm gonna have to do some research to figure out how how my sprite mappings is wrong. Um, what's this referencing? No, yeah, it's gone. Well, yeah, I need to I need to do some more research into this mappings and try and figure it out. We we tried, we didn't get we didn't get it, but I mean some of the logic is there. Um, I was about to I thought this was gonna work actually. I actually was pretty confident in it, but um We need to need 
to work on a little bit. Um, we need to figure out the sprite mappings. It just doesn't... Doesn't do it. Okay, well, I've got something running. It doesn't do anything like what I thought it was going to do, but it runs. Um, it is interesting to me that it is finding this. Actually, I wonder if there's a, um easier sprite mapping for us to use. Instead of Sonic, maybe maybe we could use a different sprite mapping, even if the color's going to be wrong, because we don't have the palette loaded. Um, maybe there is a sprite here that we could use it. Let's do, let's do rings. I'm not sure what's going to happen here because I don't know if we've got rings loaded into memory. I don't think we've... Yeah, we haven't loaded it. We haven't, so that won't work. That won't work. But what? <laughs> what? Like that actually... <laughs> We loaded up the rings mapping and it's mapped Sonic sprites into uh, onto a ring and Sonic somehow actually is complete. So this is actually better sprite mappings than what we've been using for Sonic. That doesn't make any sense at all, but... Um, there's rings in here? No. That's really annoying. I like I wanted rings or something in here to be able to test it out. Nice, maybe? Yeah, um, I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, I don't know where, like, uh, it might be, it might be compressed. Yeah, it is. It's compressed using Nemesis. I haven't got Nemesis compression in here yet, so I can't load up a lot of the, um, a lot of the art, so I have to really do, I do have to try it out with things that are uncompressed. Luckily, like, Sonic's art is uncompressed because, um, I'm not sure why Sonic's art is uncompressed. I guess it's uh, for speed reasons. That's the only thing I can think of, that they want to load up Sonic really quickly. Um, I think, actually, if you look at it, Sonic's art actually takes up quite a bit of uh, room on the on the Sonic 2 ROM. Like, it's actually, like, a, a big percentage of the Sonic 2 ROM is actually the Sonic's art because it isn't compressed at all. Um, yeah, so that's, a, that's an interesting fact, I think, that Sonic's art is uncompressed and it actually makes up a big percentage of the, of the Sonic ROM. Um... Yeah, so I don't know. Um, this Sonic mapping doesn't seem to seem to do what I thought it does. Um, I don't know if the format's wrong or or if I've read this wrong somehow. But yeah, I'm gonna have to figure that out. Okay, um, I'm gonna leave this code in here, and we'll just I don't know. I'll have to play around with it. Um, another thing I'll have to do is actually um, when I go to render a sprite. When I give back a texture here, it should actually give back a texture with the size. I'll do that real quick. Size to texture.
So I'm just gonna add the width and the height onto the texture, and when we go to render it, we can render it with the uh, width and height. should render it at the right height now um, and I can go uh, width sorry height times that whoops oh, let's see into it okay You found, oh cool, binary mapping, any help? Oh, I'll have a look at that. That sounds really good. Thank you. That sounds actually, I have seen this before and it actually looks more useful than what I've been using. So I will use that as a reference and I'll have a go at it again. Thank you, thanks, thanks for that link, that's awesome. I'll have another go reading that because that looks, oh the size works like this. Okay, goes up to zero F off this pattern repeat. Now the new mapping data. Yeah, that looks that looks like much more useful than what I've been using. I'll try that. I've seen that before. That that, that um. You know, that website's actually got some useful stuff on it, so I've seen that before, but I forgot about it. Hmm. That's a thing. Um, like, so there's a couple of concerns here, right? Like, a lot of them are zero. Keeps referencing the zero tile. I guess this is, yeah, the, the zero tile. And then a lot of them, like, it's very sporadic. Like, you can see here it goes 61,000. Like, it's it's all over the place where it's, like, zero, and then it goes up to 61,000, so it's, like, all over the place. So it's... Our sprite mapping can't be right. I'm, I'm confident that that can't be right. Um, I will have to reread that, um, you know, that other website, and hopefully I'll identify the problem from that. Header has both bytes as zero. The object is identified as a null frame. Remember that before the data starts for a frame, there is a two-byte header. Oh, remember that before data starts for a frame, there is a two-byte header. Afterwards, the data begins. Wait, what? Oh, oh, I've forgotten the... I have forgotten the, um... The header. I f didn't put the header in. That's that's the problem there. Thanks for that link. That, that's actually explaining things a lot better. Each set of two bytes identifies a each frame in the order that they are put into the game. So the first two bytes will tell you where the mapping for the null frame are located. And let me let me bring this up over here. Uh, S2 hack binary mapping. This is what I'm reading. This is this is what got linked in the in the Twitch chat. This is very good. I didn't notice that there was um there's this this format, this header. So that's, that's what screwed me up. I think that's what screwed me up. Number of sprite blocks per frame per 256 per single. Each sprite block has eight bytes of data like this. Bytes five and six don't seem to have any apparent functions. Now you need to understand eight by eight sprite loading section selections. So I've done that, I've got that. Got the, I've got that, I just need, like, this This is the sprite mapping that I've, that I've got wrong. Um, format of the actual, so, you know, it just says here, like, it's just the data is there, and it's adding that to locate the data, so there's no, it looks like there is no compression. Understand this, you must understand the format of the actual mappings used, but first you need to learn the header of each frame. 
So there's, a, there's the idea of a frame and the frame then specifies the number of blocks. The header has both bytes at zero, zero. The object will be identified as a null frame. Remember that before the data starts for a frame, there is a two byte size header. Afterwards, the data begins. Now you need to learn how to move size and other things with a sprite block. So I did get, get the two, two byte size header. I didn't get this frame thing. I don't know what this means here though. Number of sprite blocks for per for frame per 256 per single. Pretty sure I got, like, this is what I was reading and that's what I got. I didn't get this frame header. Does it mention a header? Contiguous list of sprite mappings proceeded with a word length number of mappings defines one frame for an object. Oh, okay, so there is, okay, so if I come in here, let's drop two. Let's ignore how many there are. I mean, there's a count, but let's ignore the count. Will that give us better results? No. No, it doesn't. Oh, it's a word length number. Proceed with a word length number. Word length number is, yeah, okay, two. <laughs> if it compiles, it works, yeah, especially when you do dodgy things like I do. Okay, um, all right, so that's, that's not how it works then. Okay, well, I was wrong. I thought maybe just dropping two, but then obviously, before it was working, because, you know, we're getting off eight, eight bytes here. And we were actually on the 8 byte offset, so it's like we were actually doing pretty good before. Um, yeah, list of sprite mappings proceeded with a word length number. So I think that's what they're saying here. This is the um, this is the word length number, which identifies what well, they're saying defines one frame for an object. Word length number with mapping of mappings defines one frame for an object. So this is I think is a frame, like. Uh, Actually, that's the number of sprite blocks per frame, for frame. Yeah, okay. So there's two. This is the word length that they're talking about over here. Word length number of mappings. And I think that's that. So there's a two byte size header. Um, and that's after, that's for each of the, that's for each, uh, I don't know. Yeah, this, yeah, they didn't do a great job defining this. I mean, that's another thing. <laughs> it's good when I'm writing it down in Haskell because now I've actually got better docs than, than this because, I mean, Haskell's more readable than this stuff by far. Yeah, I'm lost. I'm lost. I'm going to have to play around with it. Um, what I'm going to do right now, yeah, that's that's not quite right. Like, you can see this isn't right either. I'm, gonna, I'm basically going to what my... I've done it before. What I'm probably going to do, end up having to do, is stare at the hex. Spend probably like half an hour just staring at it. Stare at this and go backwards. Um, I've had to do it for, for things when the documentation's not been great for like the levels and that. I just kind of had to stare at it and say, well, what if it's, you know, if I skip these two, then what? Or if I... I don't know, and look for patterns. That's usually like that. That's worked for me before, but it's it sucks. You know, I hate having to do it, but it does take a while. It sucks, but I'll I'll, I'll do that. I think I'm gonna have to do it. Actually, what's interesting is that like one pattern I just noticed. Just notice how it says oh one oh one oh one oh one oh two oh two oh two oh two. Like notice how the begin the first byte of each of these words, the first byte is the same. And it goes up. And then it stops. That's interesting. Wonder what that's about. But it only happens up until here and then the pattern stops. That's interesting. 
Um, but the first word is always like the uh, because remember that um, when if the if they are palette indexes, no pattern indexes. Um, yeah, it's really weird. It's it's up until here, and then it's then it changes. Um, but yeah, when you got a pattern index, you've kind of got like um, you got one half of the byte, and then you got the the other byte. So you got the you got like the second half of the first byte, and then the other byte for a pattern index. And so this one actually rep, like is, is the flags for the index. So it tells you what palette to use if you need to flip X and Y and things like that. So maybe that's that here. But like this is this could be like whether to flip X and Y. I don't know. But you wouldn't want to be flipping X and Y that often. So so I'm not sure. But it's interesting that it does stop here. Like maybe this is a header. Maybe this massive thing here is a header. It goes up to 18, like it's counting up. It's counting up something. Anyway, I'm gonna have to explore this because this is. I hope I'm looking at the right thing actually. Yeah, this is a sprite mapping, so I'm gonna have to stare at this. It looked like I'll have to like kind of basically reverse engineer it rather than look at the documentation. It's not very, it's not very helpful at the moment. Are there any questions around Haskell around what I've been doing? Um, I've not been writing very good Haskell, but I've been writing Haskell. So if there's any questions. Um, let me know. I'm gonna commit this work. Uh, does it? I think it crashes at the moment, so I probably won't commit it like that. I'll commit it like that, even though it's obviously broken. It's gonna crash. Yep. I'll commit it like this. It'll do. All right, I'll push that in a minute. Let me know if there's any questions. I'll look for a new stream to host. We'll keep chaining this host. Uh, it looks like people are still, a few people are still around from uh, from Kmet. There he was this morning. 120 viewers, that's awesome that we're getting that many uh, viewers for Haskell code, that's awesome. Do I use Haskell often in my day job? Um, a bit. Um, not always, but a bit. Uh, most of the code on Marketplace, so I work on uh, Marketplace. Unless your Marketplace, uh, this is where you can like download plugins for all of our products and that. This is what I work on. Most of it is written in um, Scala. I think there's like a hundred thousand lines of Scala uh, in this. Some of it is written in Haskell. Um, not a lot. I reckon a couple of thousand, a couple of thousand lines. I, I hate measuring things in lines. Uh, like you can get a lot done in in one line of code. Um, but I've, just just to put it in perspective, it's like hundred thousand lines of Scala code and and a few thousand in, in, in Haskell, so it's not a huge amount. And the and the Haskell stuff isn't extremely critical like the Scala code is. So I don't know. It's um, there's a bit of Haskell, and I use it every now and then. When we um, when we use Marketplace, there's actually like a, a lot of our build tools is written in Haskell. Like a lot of um, like we've got chatbots that's written in Haskell. Um. We've got like build notification stuff. It's written in Haskell. Um, a lot of our tooling is written in Haskell and not a huge amount is uh, like, when you hit marketplace, you are actually hitting some, some Haskell code. Um, but most of it is actually like in our deployments, um, deployment tools and stuff. Just because it's a lot easier to introduce there. Um, the operations people, um, myself and a few other people, like we know, we know Haskell and so we just write it. Um, and it's just good for writing tools. So we've been writing a lot of tools in Haskell, but yeah, not a huge amount of code actually in in the in the marketplace thing. There is there is a little bit, not much. So I, I use Haskell somewhat often, not a huge amount. Somewhat often, every couple like every it wouldn't be every week I write Haskell, but every every couple of weeks I'll probably spend a couple of days writing Haskell. Have I done type level programming in Haskell? If so, I'm wondering what you think about using true with post true versus true without the at the type level. Um, do you think it's okay to leave it off, or is it too confusing? Um, I've done a little bit in Haskell. I haven't actually used a huge amount. Um, I haven't done a lot. Um, I think the apostrophe used to be required and now it's not because we can detect it. And I think the convention now is to leave it off. I, I mean, I haven't, I haven't done a huge amount, so I might be wrong, but I think, it, I think the convention now is to, is to really not, not use it. I'm not sure. I I think it's okay to leave it off. I I leave it off if if you know if there's no compiler warnings or anything saying hey this is deprecated or anything. I I definitely I'd leave it off. I wouldn't bother putting extra syntax in. That does nothing. 
That's usually my that's usually my thing. If the syntax is doing nothing, get rid of it. Okay, how to solve how to code a Sudoku puzzle in PHP? Or how not? Okay, we might not do PHP. I uh, don't know what that is. Don't know what that is. Learning Java. Mm. Math background? I think we did that one before. I don't know. I think the person was actually away. I hosted that person and they were actually not at their desk, so I don't know. Haskell Code Wars. We could. Yeah, let's go Haskell Code Wars. There we go. Got a Haskell stream. Got a got to got to host the Haskell streamer. Oh, it's uh, it's Freeman. Okay, we know Freeman. He's he's on the chat often. Cool. Okay, so we're gonna. I don't know his thing doesn't look on, but anyway, let me refresh. And make sure he's he's on. Still a warning if you leave it off, which is interesting. Oh, okay. There's a warning. Okay, if there's a warning, I probably would leave it on then. All right. Um, yes. So that's my. If there's any other questions, I think my final opinion on that is leave it on because there's a warning otherwise. And so don't, I like compiling, as you see, I compile and make sure everything doesn't warn. Except I do have one warning. I do have some warnings at the moment and I've got to fix that up. But I hate warnings. I get rid of warnings. Um, yeah, so I'd probably not use, I probably would leave the apostrophe on. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. I've been streaming for like three and a half hours, so I'll leave it there. Um, Thanks to Komet for the host. That was awesome this morning. Um, and thanks to his help and opinions. That was great. Thanks for everyone's opinions today. Um, thanks for tuning in. Um, we're making some progress on Sonic. Um, I want to get, if I get, like, I've made some progress on the level loading in the last week. We had pallets. We only had pallets last week. So we made, made I've made quite a bit of progress in the last week. Um, tiles are good, but now we need to generalize that to sprites. I oh, forget sprites. We can actually start doing animation. And then things will be pretty good after that. That'd be pretty good. Oh, you turn the warning off. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's another solution. Okay. So I'm pretty happy with how with the progress we're making. Um, hopefully we'll be able to get animation and like actually moving the sprite around um, and then start on physics and that. I think that'll be the interesting thing. Like getting Sonic physics right will be, you know, it'll be tricky and it'll be fun. I think it'll be good. So I'm excited for that. Um, okay, cool. I'm going to host uh, Freeman, say hi to him. Um, then I need to do some actual work for work. I need to probably, I don't think I'm writing Haskell today. I think I'm doing like a incident response thing. I have to write up a report on an incident, but anyway, I'll do that. I've got to do some actual work, so I'll leave it at that. I'm going to host Freeman, say hi to him. Um, and thanks for tuning in. Thanks for looking me, watching me write Haskell to, to re-implement Sonic 2. Um, I'll push the code, I'll push what I've got and, and we can do the same thing next week. Cool. All right, I'll uh, I'll see you all next week, and I I might actually upload this one, uh, upload this uh, video to YouTube, uh, even though it was me screwing around with uh, you know, with bytes a lot, but I'll upload it to YouTube. Cool. Okay, thanks for tuning in. Say hi to Freeman. All right, catch up next week.